The next item of business is a debate on motion 12070 in the name of Tom Arthur on Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Tom Arthur to speak to and move the motion. Up to 14 minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address the Chamber today on the general principles of the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill and in doing so move the motion in my name. This is not a big bill and it is not a radical reform. This reflects the fact that our bankruptcy system here in Scotland is widely perceived as meeting our needs. But it does represent a chance to make things better for a small number of individuals with both severe debt problems and severe mental health issues. The links between debt and poor mental health are well known and we are clearly set out uh, by many of the expert witnesses who gave evidence to the committee. And I thank the Economy and Fair Work Committee for its scrutiny of the bill. I also thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and the Finance and Public Administration Committee for their put into this and thank all those who gave evidence at stage one. The proposals in this bill come from stakeholder-led groups who looked at each of the statutory debt solutions to determine what improvements could be made. They have been subject to extensive public consultation. They reflect those stakeholder recommendations that have achieved a level of consensus and where the change requires primary legislation. The stakeholders involved each represent their own areas of interest and therefore have come from different perspectives. Creditors, advisors representing those who are struggling with debt, trustees and sheriff's officers were amongst those working together to make improvements to our debt solutions and diligence. I would like to pay tribute to the work of all stakeholders whose recommendations are being brought forward and enabled by this bill. The bill will create the enabling power for a mental health moratorium to help improve the lives of people who are struggling with debt and serious mental health issues. The Mental Health Moratorium meets a recommendation made in the Social Justice and Social Security Committee report, Robbing Peter to Pay Paul, on their inquiry into low income and problem debt. The bill is intended to enable specific proposals for the moratorium based on the advice of the Mental Health Moratorium Working Group. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to Tom Arthur for giving way. Do you not recognise, though, that the very fact that this is an enabling bill rather than a bill that sets out criteria and mechanisms and thresholds makes it actually quite difficult for us to scrutinise this bill as to whether or not it will actually deliver on the intent that he sets out? Would you recognise that that's a, a weakness as Parliament considers it this afternoon? Minister. I think the member makes a fair point, and it is something that I will uh, turn to um, as I progress through my prepared remarks. I would like to commend the members of the Mental Health Moratorium Working Group. The members of that working group also included mental health professionals who were able to contribute professional expertise in the field of mental health and draw lessons from the Mental Health Crisis Moratorium introduced in England and Wales in 2021. Briefly. Stephen Kerr. But the whole problem with the recommendations of the working group is if the government eventually produce those as their specific proposals, they will give people in the situation of suffering mental health and financial crisis less protection in Scotland than people in a similar situation in England and Wales. That can't be right, can it? Minister. Again, I will, I will come on to um, further detail of what we would take forward in the regulations. Um, but the detail of how this will work in practice, as I say, it will be set out in regulations. And I want to note that I do accept the recommendations of the Economy and Fair Work Committee that these details should be scrutinised by the committee ahead of stage three of this bill. We have recently completed a consultation on proposals for these regulations and the feedback is being analysed. At a very high level, I can confirm that the majority of respondents were in favour of most of the proposals, subject to the caveat that responses were qualified by their narrative comments that, and that we have agreed to allow a short extension to accommodate those stakeholders who have asked for additional time. 
I can, however, add that one point in which it is clear that comments will need to be carefully considered is in terms of the eligibility criteria for the moratorium, on which there are a range of views, and this is also noted in the Stage 1 report of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. The protections that could potentially be offered to someone who is eligible for this scheme are quite significant. And I therefore want to be cautious against setting the eligibility criteria too widely. We do not want to discourage creditors from lending to the group we are most trying to help. This is something I am keen to avoid, and I am therefore looking to find a good balance. We already have a standard moratorium in place, which currently gives those struggling with debts six months' protection from creditors. It provides them time to decide how best to deal with their debts, and, many, and for many this standard moratorium will be sufficient. The committee's report recommends that we should increase the protection for persons under a mental health moratorium, specifically in relation to eviction and the installation of prepayment meters. It remains my view that we already have measures in place in Scotland to protect people from eviction, including a statutory requirement for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to consider the reasonableness of granting an eviction in all cases, including where there are arrears of rent. But I will look into this matter to provide assurance on this point. Prepayment meters may be more difficult to address, but I can confirm that I am writing to the UK Government on this, and I am happy to consider what further action may be needed here, and I will keep the committee fully informed. The Working Group recommended that the moratorium would not be appropriate where a debtor lacks the capacity to consent. I note that the committee has recommended that this should be reconsidered. This was an issue discussed in the recent consultation. And I will look at this again in light of the committee's views once I have had the chance to consider the consultation responses. I will also look at the committee's concerns about the public register and how this can be introduced in a way that addresses their concerns. I am mindful that as well as protecting the interests of the individuals entering a mental health moratorium, that we also need to protect the legitimate interests of creditors. I will continue to look for a solution which can meet both of these objectives. I appreciate concerns have been expressed about the extra pressure that may be placed on the advice sector by introducing a mental health moratorium. The advice sector has been helping to shape proposals and I will continue to consider the potential impact on the sector as we seek to finalise the detail behind the scheme. I can also confirm that the Scottish Government will be working with the advice and mental health sectors to develop clear guidance and training to enable them to deliver the mental health moratorium. And we will work with them to ensure the tools they need are available. When I gave my evidence to the committee, my colleague Kevin Stewart recommended that we should look at the lived experience forum to seek input from them relevant to our proposals for the mental health moratorium. I can confirm that we have engaged with that forum and are arranging an event with them to do that. Other provisions in the Bill make minor and technical amendments to the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 that would serve to provide clarity and improve the operation of the bankruptcy process. The Bill will provide more efficient recovery processes to assist businesses and local authorities to collect debts from those who can pay, whilst importantly protecting those who are unable to pay. The bankruptcy and diligence provisions in the Bill implement measures which were supported by stakeholders in response to a consultation carried out between August and October 2022. This consultation sought feedback on proposals from members of the working groups in Stage 2 of the Scottish Government's review of the operation of existing statutory debt solutions. I am pleased to note the Committee's support for the measures set out in the Bill. I have noted the Committee's recommendations that amendments should be introduced at Stage 2 to allow the discharge of trustees where debtors have not cooperated in their bankruptcy, also on the charging of statutory interest and recall of bankruptcy, and to extend the time in which a Sheriff's officer can serve a warrant to cite a debtor in a petition for sequestration. I will look at these matters further in the light of the Committee's report and consider whether amendments might be appropriate in these matters. There are some other matters raised by stakeholders in their evidence to the Committee which we will look at but which can be addressed through secondary legislation. 
This would include such matters as the minimum period for a reapplying for bankruptcy under the minimum assets procedure and the minimum income for earnings arrestment. As I said to the committee, I think that where things can be addressed in secondary legislation, that is often the best way in which to address them. I am committed to further engagement with stakeholders on these matters since, as the committee notes, there were also some concerns about unintended impacts raised in the evidence sessions. The working groups involved in looking at each of the statutory debt solutions also made recommendations which can be dealt with through secondary legislation. This bill is therefore part of a package of legislation, and together we will make important changes to our debt solutions. I expect to start bringing forward regulations later this month, and I will bring forward further regulations over the next few months. This will include important changes to protected trustees. As I have said, this bill is a part of a wider programme of reform, and we have commissioned an independent review to assess how far current statutory debt solutions meet the needs of a modern economy. This work has been taken forward by Yvonne McDermott, OBE. Yvonne brings a wealth of experience to this work, having served as Chief Executive at Money Advice Scotland for many years. Yvonne has been setting the foundations for this review and will shortly commence a set of stakeholder meetings to help inform this work. In summary, this bill brings forward small but important changes to bankruptcy and diligence. The introduction of a mental health moratorium is an important step and will help those with the most severe mental health conditions and financial challenges. I very much look forward to hearing members' views this afternoon, and I would ask them to support the bill at decision time. Thank you. And members may wish to know that we do have time in hand this afternoon and would hope to give back time where interventions are taken. I now call on Claire Baker to speak on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Up to 13 minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Com Committee in the role as convener in the Stage 1 debate on the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who responded to our call for views and the witnesses who gave evidence during our Stage 1 scrutiny of the Bill. I would also like to thank One Parent Family Scotland and the Poverty Alliance for engaging with the Committee. Hearing the issues faced by those with lived experience of debt and mental health issues was valuable for my appreciation of the complexity of the issue and the reality for people struggling with their finances and debt. We recognise that it would not have been easy for them to share these experiences and I want to sincerely thank those involved for being honest and open about their challenges. While the introduction of a mental health moratorium is widely supported, the committee have to be satisfied that it will support those who need to access this mechanism. Lastly, I would like to thank the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for highlighting relevant points from their Robbing Peter to Pay Paul Low Income and Debt Trap report. This is recognised as an important piece of work and we should all, across all committees, consider how we can give effect to their recommendations if the opportunity arises. As you can see from our Stage 1 report, the Committee is supportive of the Bill's aims. The introduction of a mental health moratorium would be beneficial to those who need it, and we welcome the minor and technical reforms and modifications to both the Bankruptcy Scotland 2016 Act and the Law of Diligence, Scotland's formal debt recovery mechanism. However, we were disappointed at the lack of detail made available to us during the Stage 1 scrutiny of the mental health moratorium, as we were unable to discuss proposals in detail with stakeholders. More information on the Scottish Government's proposed policy direction was provided when the Mental Health Moratorium consultation was published in November 2023, but this unfortunately came far too late for us to discuss in depth with our witnesses. We acknowledge that most of the detail pertaining to the Mental Health Moratorium will be brought forward in regulations. We welcome the Minister's undertaking to produce draft regulations ahead of Stage 3 and to share these with the Committee. We look forward to scrutinising these in detail. I recognise the Government intends to run a further full consultation on the draft regulations, which will provide the Committee with additional time to scrutinise regulations. One of the key areas for discussion this afternoon will be the criteria for qualifying for a mental health moratorium. Whilst the Committee supports the introduction of a mental health moratorium, we are concerned that only a very small percentage of Scotland's population stand to benefit from the proposals. I recognise that the Mental Health Moratorium Working Group agreed that only those who are subject to a compulsory treatment order or those receiving compulsory treatment under the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 
should be eligible. And we did hear evidence from some witnesses that it was preferable to start with a small cohort to ensure that the scheme works properly before possible expansion. However, One Parent Family Scotland and the Poverty Alliance said the compulsory treatment order criteria would only help a very small number of people. The policy memorandum estimates between 112 and 500 people. But as, it is, as this is based on a more open entry criteria as it compares to breathing space, uptake is likely to be at the lower end of this scale. The policy memorandum also reports that one in two adults with debt have mental health problems and that one in four people with mental health problems are also in debt. We heard from, Scottish, sorry, we heard from South Lanarkshire Council that for the mental health moratorium to have the biggest impact, it should be accessible to people who are receiving treatment in the community, not just those in hospitals or other institutions. It was also suggested that Scotland's standard moratorium of six months would provide sufficient respite for people struggling with mental health challenges. And it was even suggested it would be preferable as it is easier to apply for compared to the information and processes that would be required for a mental health moratorium. It does raise the question of how significant the introduction of a mental health moratorium is. Yes, it will be valuable for the small number of people who can access it, but we should recognise the system we already have in place does provide a degree of respite. Indeed, in replying to the committee, the Minister argued the current standard moratorium will be sufficient for many. During the pandemic, we saw the increase of a standard moratorium rise from six weeks to six months. While the committee welcomes the Minister's assurances that there are no immediate plans to reduce the standard moratorium, we are aware of a previous commitment that the increase would be temporary. The committee would be concerned if the criteria remains narrow and the standard moratorium was to return to six weeks, that this would leave many debtors in a vulnerable situation. So the committee concluded that widening the entry criteria would enable more people to qualify for support, avoiding the unnecessary distress that might exacerbate someone's mental health issues. While the government's response so far does not appear convinced by our argument, there is to be further analysis of consultation responses and the committee will scrutinise these once available. The committee does recognise that a mental health moratorium could not apply to everyone who has a mental health condition and debt challenges, but we believe that the right balance has not been struck and the policy risk being not sufficiently effective. The committee has identified three alternatives to the proposed entry criteria that we would encourage the Minister to consider. The first is using the severely mentally impaired criteria from council tax legislation. While this is a recognised term in the Local Government Finance Act 1992, we strongly suggest that this term is stigmatising and outdated, and we draw this to the attention of the Scottish Government in the hope that the legislation can be updated. We welcome that the Government has said they will look for an opportunity to amend this term in primary legislation. Notwithstanding the term, the criteria which is used by local authorities for assessing council tax should be considered. The second alternative is to use the debt and mental health evidence form currently used by money advice sector to evaluate the impact of someone's mental health on their ability to manage their finances. This recognises the role of the professions who are supporting people in financial difficulties and supports their ability to make a judgment of a person's capacity to manage their situation. Thirdly, the committee proposes using similar criteria to the debt respite scheme in England and Wales, also known as breathing space. The mental health breathing space is open to anyone who is receiving mental health crisis treatment, as well as those who are receiving emergency or acute treatment. Entry to, the criteria, sorry, entry to the scheme must be certified by an approved medical health practitioner. The advantage to replicating this scheme is that it already exists and it is in operation. The most recent figures show that just under 1,500 people accessed a mental health breathing space. The committee does recognise it's not a straightforward comparison. The standard moratorium in England is shorter than that in Scotland. But the English and Welsh system is also a tested system, which appears more realistic about who will need to access the system. The breathing space moratorium goes further than the proposal set out in the mental health moratorium consultation by the Scottish Government in other respects. The committee heard from Alan McIntosh from Advice Talks that breathing space also stops cars being repossessed, stops evictions and repossessions, and stops prepayment meters being forcibly installed. The Minister might want to reflect on these differences, and I appreciate he did refer to this in his opening statement. 
His reply to the committee describes the protections as quite significant, but they are not offering as much protection as the UK's breathing space moratorium. While the committee understands the regulation of the energy sector, including the use of prepayment metres, is reserved, uh, and we welcome the commitment from the Scottish Government to liaise with the UK Government on this issue, we would urge the Government to look at the other areas around evictions, repossession and joint and, and several liability, and welcome that further views are being sought. The committee was made aware of an issue regarding mental health uh, capacity. Potentially, a small number of people who meet the entry criteria for the mental health moratorium might be unable to consent to the moratorium as they do not have the capacity or have a legally recognised representative to do so for them. Academics from the University of Aberdeen agreed that further consideration of debtor capacity is needed. This is another area which, in the Minister's response to the committee, he reports that further views are being sought through more consultation. Others have raised that the bill contains only enabling powers with much reliance on details to follow in regulations. This has made the scrutiny of the committee difficult and mental capacity is likely to be one of the many areas we will return to during scrutiny of draft regulations, which we expect to see prior to stage three. Uh, consideration of the mental health moratorium revealed the possible development of a public register of people who access a mental health moratorium. This is of great concern to the committee during the evidence session with the Minister for Community, Wealth and Public Finance, we explored the risks around stigmatising people who are in need of a moratorium. The committee is concerned that exposure on a public register may stop individuals from accessing the support that they need. We have asked for more clarity from the Scottish Government on this proposal and we look forward to receiving an update on potential areas of contention, such as how long someone's information will be stored on the register and who can view or access that data. Um, sections 2 to 5 of the bill cover minor or technical fixes that have been identified by the Scottish Government as necessary for the Bankruptcy Scotland 2016 Act, and we welcome these changes. However, whilst taking evidence, we heard that additional reform to bankruptcy legislation would be welcomed by stakeholders. One area required in reform is that of minimum asset process bankruptcy. Minimum asset process bankruptcy is a route into bankruptcy for individual debtors with low income and few assets. It is a simpler and cheaper process appropriate for these circumstances. Currently, it's only possible to apply for a minimal asset process bankruptcy once every 10 years. The Social Justice and Social Security Committee argued that people should be able to apply for a minimum asset process bankruptcy every five years, bringing it in line with full administration bankruptcy. The committee is in agreement and we await the outcome from the Scottish Government's discussions with stakeholders. Sections 6 to 10 of the bill make reforms to the current law on formal debt enforcement. These changes were recommended by the Diligence Working Group. The committee is broadly supportive of these reforms and we draw the Scottish Government's attention to the proposals outlined in our report. Um, in closing, I would particularly like to draw the Minister's attention to the protected minimum amount seized in diligence against earnings, such as wage arrestments. This is a form of diligence which requires the employer of a debtor to make a deduction from a debtor's net earnings. The amount taken from earnings depends on how much someone earns, with the percentage of money seized increasing as earnings increase. Currently, the amount protected from any creditor action is £655.83. The Minister will be aware of calls for the protected minimum amount to be increased to £1,000. That would bring earnings arrestment in line with bank arrestments. The Robin Peter to pay Paul report recommended this increase. As we are in a cost of living crisis with those individuals and their families who are on the lowest incomes feeling the impact of inflation and rising prices most sharply, we should take this opportunity to increase the allowance. Most of the debt in this category is council tax debt. In 21-22, 83% of charge for payments were for council tax debt. A survey from Advice uh, Scotland by Alan McIntosh found that 59% of wage arrestments were for council tax. 94% of respondents said wage arrestments left them unable to pay essential bills each month, with 76% of them falling into arrears and unable to pay other debt. Creditors are entitled to seek repayment of debt, but it should not be unduly harsh. The committee supports increasing the protected minimum amount as being reasonable and urges the Scottish Government to consider how this bill can be used to deliver that change. 
Uh, President officer, I have not been able to cover every aspect of our consideration, although members might think I have given it a good effort this afternoon, uh, of the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill, but I anticipate other points will be covered by my colleagues from the committee. I will conclude by confirming that the Economy and Fair Work Committee supports the general principles of the Bill and looks forward to receiving more detailed information from the Scottish Government in advance of stages two and three, should the Parliament approve the Bill general principles at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Murdo Fraser. Up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by reminding members of my register of interests in that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, albeit not currently practising. And can I echo the thanks of the committee convener who has just spoken to all those who gave evidence to the committee about the bill, to SPICE for their very helpful background briefings, and to the committee clerks for their assistance in the preparation of our report. And I think it speaks for itself that uh, this was a report that was agreed unanimously and there is very little political disagreement between members of the committee as to our approach to the bill. Now, I am something of a veteran of committee consideration of bankruptcy legislation in this parliament. In session two, I sat on the committee that scrutinised the Bankruptcy and Diligence etc. Scotland Act 2007, and then in session four, the subsequent Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014. And here we are with yet another piece of bankruptcy legislation seeking to improve and update the law in an area where there's always a need for changes to be made. Before I come to the detail of the bill before us, it might be worth taking a moment just to reflect on the wider policy background to bankruptcy law. The term bankruptcy is normally seen as a pejorative one that carries negative connotations. Someone who is described as a bankrupt is often seen as somebody who has failed. They have not been able to meet their financial obligations. In reality, bankruptcy should be seen as something positive. Bankruptcy exists to provide a protection for individuals who fall into debt and the relief from those debts. If the option of bankruptcy did not exist, people who find themselves in a situation where they had run up too many debts would never be able to escape them and we would be pursued by their creditors on an indefinite basis. They would never have the chance to wipe the slate clean and start afresh. And that is what bankruptcy provides. Individuals can declare they are unable to meet their financial obligations. A trustee will then be appointed to administer their, their affairs and agree settlement with creditors. And after a set period of time in our current law that stands at one year, the debtor will be deemed to be free of those debts and able to resume control of his or her financial affairs. It is an acceptance in law that people do make mistakes in life, that businesses sometimes fail, and no one should be punished permanently for that, but everyone descends and deserves a second chance. Uh, yes, of course. Stephen Kerr. Does, does Murdo Fraser agree that it would be a beneficial thing for the overall culture of enterprise in this country if we had a less stigmatising approach to bankruptcy, especially when it comes to businesses? Murdo Fraser. Yes, that's a very interesting uh, intervention from my colleague, and I would, I would agree with that tone. If you look at uh, the experience in the United States, businesses uh, of successful entrepreneurs very often fail a number of times before they are ultimately successful, and people regard that as run-of-the-mill as part of an entrepreneurial culture. So I think he makes a fair point about the need to see uh, business failure as not always a, a negative, although, of course, there are negative consequences often for the creditors. But there is, uh, as I maybe alluded to, a, a potential moral hazard here, because if bankruptcy is seen as too easy, it can be a tool for individuals to act irresponsibly or, or even recklessly or run up debts knowing they will not have to repay them. So what bankruptcy law has to try to do is strike a balance between the interests of the creditors and the interests of debtors. And there are some popular misconceptions about who those creditors might be. In most bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies, the largest creditors are usually public agencies, such as HMRC or local councils. The most common debt that leads to diligence proceedings in Scotland today is council tax. So if we go too far in shifting the balance towards the rights of the debtors, then what we are doing is potentially depriving public services 
of much needed revenue. Yes, I'll go away. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to Murdoch Freese for giving me. I wonder if you might agree with me that actually there's quite an interesting contrast in approaches now taken between public agencies and private business. The banks now actually in some ways taking a much broader view about supporting people through financial difficulties, whereas actually quite often it's councils who are, can be some of the most aggressive agencies in pursuing debts. And that's something that we need to think about as we think about this issue in the round. I think that's a very uh, fair point um, uh, Mr Johnson makes and in fact in the evidence given to the committee some of the uh, strongest wording evidence uh, against some of the protections, additional protections for debtors came from I think it was City of Edinburgh Council in the evidence they gave us. So, uh, and, and, and to be fair maybe that's a reflection of the financial pressure the councils feel themselves under that they have to try and recover uh, whatever sums are, are due to them. There is also a risk if bankruptcy legislation goes too far in protecting the debtor in that it creates an active disincentive for mainstream financial institutions to be involved in lending to those who may be deemed financially vulnerable. And that means that those individuals cannot then access finance from reputable sources and therefore are left with no option but to go to the unregulated uh, loan sharks who operate out with the law. And that cannot be in anyone's interest. And that just demonstrates why there needs to be a careful balance when drawing up bankruptcy rules, and that balance was reflected in the evidence the committee heard on the bill before us. Now, as we've heard from the Minister and the committee convener, this bill makes what are in the main fairly minor and technical reforms to existing bankruptcy legislation. The most significant reform in the bill, and the one that took up most of the committee's time, was the introduction of a specific protection for debtors who have a mental illness, with the creation of a moratorium on debt recovery action. This is not a novel concept. It, it reflects the breathing space scheme which already exists in England and Wales, where individuals receiving crisis treatment, encompassing those in compulsory treatment, as well as those with conditions of comparable severity, who are receiving crisis, emergency or acute treatment without compulsion, are protected from bankruptcy proceedings. And as we have heard, the committee received widespread support from stakeholders for the principle of a mental health moratorium. However, we also heard there was concern at the lack of detail about how such a moratorium would operate in practice. The Mental Health Moratorium Working Group agreed that the entry criteria should only apply to those subject to compulsory treatment orders, therefore excluding individuals with severe mental health issues who were in receipt of inpatient care and treatment on a voluntary basis. This approach was criticised by a number of those who gave evidence, including One Parent Family Scotland and the Poverty Alliance, who felt this approach was too narrow and would only help a very small number of people. The alternative suggestion was the use of severely mentally impaired, which currently exists in council tax legislation, but there are concerns that this language is now outdated. The committee's concern, as we heard from the convener, is that in asking us to agree the general principles and pass the bill at this stage without any detail as to how the moratorium would work in practice, essentially we were being asked to write a blank cheque to the government. And we therefore asked the government to provide more detail ahead of stage two of the bill as to how the scheme would work in practice. Uh, yes, of course. Fergus Yes, I, I think he, he sets out the, the challenge very clearly. Is, is there a, not a concomitant risk that um, that many debtors are aware of the fact that mental health may provide a method of getting a pause, uh, may instruct solicitors that they have a mental health problem, perhaps with, with some merit and some substance. And therefore, is there not a very serious risk that if we go through this bill without defining exactly what it is that we want to do, that we end up with unintended consequences of a huge number of people seeking to take advantage of a loophole that is not really intended for them. Murdoch Fraser. Well, Mr Ewing, with his usual lawyery background, makes a, a, a very fair point in relation to the potential unintended consequences. Now, I was very pleased to note in his letter to the committee last week, the Minister has reiterated his undertaking to ensure that the draft regulations he intends to bring forward will be shared with us before stage three. And I welcome that assurance because it is, in my view, essential that Parliament has the opportunity to see these regulations before voting on the bill in its final form, although some of us might want to go even further than that in terms of putting more detail on the face of the bill. 
Now, that was the major reform in the Bill. There were a number of other minor changes in addition being introduced, which largely uh, we found to be uh, uncontroversial. An important point made by witnesses was about the lack of capacity in the money advice sector to ensure that individuals facing serious financial challenges had people to turn to to get support. And I would encourage the Scottish Government to address this particular matter. There was some discussion in committee around the time limits for the minimal asset process, MAP bankruptcy. This applies where debtors have low income and very few assets and is a simplified procedure. At present, it is only possible to apply for MAP bankruptcy once in 10 years. But some witnesses have told us they should be reduced to five years in line with full administration bankruptcy, thus making it easier for debtors in that category to get relief. There was some opposition to this. City of Edinburgh Council expressing concern that it might be used by people to write off council debts more easily, which reflects Mr Johnson's point earlier. But it is something the Scottish Government should give consideration to. If I have time, presiding officer, there are three other points I would like to cover briefly, yes, please. Go ahead. if I may. Um, the, the question of discharge of trustees was alluded to, I think, by the committee convener. ICAS told us in evidence they would like to see trustees able to be discharged once they have taken all reasonable steps to deal with debtors who cannot be found, who are uncooperative. Otherwise, we end up in a situation where trustees have to hold a position indefinitely, despite the fact they cannot take any action because they cannot contact the debtor. That seems a very sensible reform, and I would encourage the Scottish Government uh, to take it further. Secondly, there is an issue around the number of days uh, in which a petition for bankruptcy can be served. At current, uh, as the, current, the law currently stands, a petition must be served no more than 14 days before a hearing and no fewer than six days before it, giving an eight-day window. And the evidence from the Society of Messengers at Arms and Sheriff Officers was that this creates a real practical issue for them, particularly dealing with uh, debtors living in remote and rural areas such as the Scottish Highlands. They suggested extending that window to 21 days, and that would seem a very sensible and practical uh, change that could be made. And thirdly and finally, uh, we heard some evidence around the uh, arrestees' duty of disclosure, where the bill requires arrestees to respond uh, to all uh, attempts uh, to arrest uh, wages uh, and accounts. Uh, this will present quite significant resource implications for institutions, including uh, the banks. The Nat West Group suggested an alternative approach that might reduce the administrative burden, and I hope the Scottish Government will look at this. So, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, this is a relatively modest and welcome piece of legislation. There are reforms here which are necessary and which we would uh, like to see progress, and I hope the Scottish Government will work with, with stakeholders and with the Committee to ensure that our ongoing concerns particularly around the operation of the mental health moratorium, are addressed. And I am pleased to say the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the general principles of the Bill at Stage 1. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. And I now call Daniel Johnson. Around eight minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Mental health and debt all too often go hand in hand and lead to absolutely disastrous social consequences, both for people immediately affected but for a wider society. So therefore, the need to legislate in this area is clear. And it's why Scottish Labour is broadly supportive of this bill and will be supporting it at stage one in terms of the general principles. However, I think it is important to note that we have concerns about the mechanisms by which people will uh, 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 trigger uh, the, 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 uh, such a moratorium, the threshold uh, by, at which it may be obtained, and thirdly, the protections that are afforded to those that choose to do so. But overall, and more, perhaps more importantly, I have concerns about the approach taken by the government in this bill. Essentially, uh, legislating for, uh, an approach, but leaving the detail in all of these matters that I've just set out to be detailed in secondary legislation, therefore denying us the possibility of scrutinising them here today. And I think that is problematic. But this is an important area because we know that poor mental health go hand in hand with uh, money problems. I think that is self-evident. And indeed, we know that people with mental health problems are three and a half times more likely to be in debt. And that leads to a cascading situation where one in turn impacts the other, leaving our society uh, and families devastated along the way. And that is all the more so 
as we are in the middle of a cost of living crisis, where family bills are going up and up and those pressures uh, mount. And it's why it is important, and we welcome the intent and the provisions such as they are set out. But first of all, I think I would like to just uh, ask the question around the mechanisms, because by definition, the people we are talking about lack capacity. The people we are talking about are, are in the most deep uh, of mental health crises, as set out uh, in the uh, policy memorandum and the uh, mental health moratorium uh, working group. And we have to ask ourselves whether they actually have the capacity or even the physical means. I, I will just take the intervention a, a second um, uh, to do so. I have uh, the Royal Edinburgh Hospital in my constituency. I am contacted by people there. Very often, it is quite far down the line that they even have the means of communication to do so. And if those are the people that we are talking about, I would just question whether or not they have the capacity, but actually, as I say, also the physical means to take out such a moratorium. Uh, very happy to give way. Stephen Kerr. You to Dan Joseph. Does he agree, though, at the end of this process, of this legislation, that people in Scotland in the distressing circumstances which we are outlining ought to be no less protected than people living in England and Wales? Surely that is the threshold at which we should be judging the, uh, the detail of the bill around the moratorium. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I, 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 I think Mr Kerr makes a, a valid point that we need to, if we are approaching this legislation, ensuring that we are doing the most that we can. And if there are examples elsewhere, and particularly close at home, we should be looking at what we can do. So indeed, I think we need to be questioning whether or not, if this is, legislation is not going as far as the temporary provisions that we enacted recently during COVID, I think we need to ask ourselves whether this bill goes far enough. But I think the point I was just touching about the capacity also leads on to the threshold point, because we don't have clarity. And while I understand that the government will publish draft regulations before stage three, it's very hard to understand precisely what group of people this will apply to. As we look at the proposals from the Mental Health and Moratorium Working Group, their, their suggestion is those undergoing compulsory treatment orders. In other words, in colloquial terms, those who are essentially sectioned. That's an extraordinarily high threshold. As we all know, that is only people in the most severe forms, most acute forms of mental health distress, those who are likely to harm to themselves and others will find themselves in that situation. Now, I understand, and indeed I agree with what the Minister was saying about the need to find a balance, but I would say, suggest that that threshold is too high. By the same token, I do understand that the, the, the Happy to give way. Prime Minister. Very grateful, Mr Johnson, for giving way. Would he also recognise then, and, and if we take it outside of that criteria, which I think most of us would agree with, there is an issue of resource that has to be addressed there? Daniel Johnson. This was the very point I was coming to. Uh, because I, I, while I think abroad, just essentially those undergoing mental health treatment would be far too low, that would, for example, include me as somebody uh, undergoing ongoing mental health treatment. My concern, actually, is not so much that, that people with ADHD or autistic spectrum disorder might not need this, but actually the fact that many of those people who find themselves in those situations where their conditions are leading to dire financial situations quite simply can't access the resource, the help, the, the, the clinicians, as Mr Whistle is alluding to, who might be able to provide them with the diagnosis and the help they need. So I think we do need to look at what the criteria is. I think it needs to be tightly drawn up, but we also need to look at the access to the people that might well end up as gatekeepers. I would commend the committee for their work. I think their suggestions about other criteria are well made, such as those used in England and Wales uh, for the breathing space. I think also, and while I take um, the comments of the convener uh, as she made them about the stigmatising nature of the terminology, but the severely mentally impaired category from council tax is clearly a workable one, and I would ask why we're not using it. We do need to ask ourselves also how the moratorium will work in practice. Uh, we need to understand what protections and provisions it will take. It, will it, it uh, include the positive enforcement actions? Will it pause contact from creditors? Will it freeze interest and charges on debts? I think questions such as uh, car payments and car loans, which are the forms of debt so many people uh, have, will have been entering into prior to the point of uh, mental health crisis, these are the sorts of questions that need to be answered, and quite simply, we don't. But I think there is, as Mr Kerr alluded to, a risk 
uh, that we may legislate uh, for protections that are currently less than those available uh, in Scotland on a temporary basis or less than those in England and Wales. But moreover, I have severe concerns about the nature of this bill indeed. As I was looking at the, the bill itself in preparation for this, first of all, I was struck by the lack of specificity. We don't have any of these points about the mechanisms, thresholds or protections set out here, or even in principle. But when you look at section one, subsection three, and you look at what the scope of regulations that can be brought forward by ministers, I have to say I am quite concerned. So in subsection three, it states that regulations may, under the section, uh, may make different provision for different purposes, may modify any enactment, and include incidental, supplementary, consequential, transitional, transi transitory, or saving provision. That is extraordinary scope. That essentially en enables ministers, albeit with a tenuous link to this bill, make changes to any uh, act of this parliament uh, and, and do so uh, 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 for different purposes. I mean, I just find this quite concerning. To not even have the guide rails of principles, of criteria, to guide what those provisions may be made under, I think this is quite concerning. And I think we need to guard against this sort of legislation, which seems to be coming forward more frequently from this government. Because after all, and while I take the, the, the points being made by the government about the need to get this right, I would argue it's important to get the, those details right before you publish a bill before it is put in front of Parliament, because that is what this place is for. Because as uh, was pointed out um, by um, uh, 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 in one of the previous interventions, there can be unintended consequences. Thresholds around um, mental health criteria, around issues such as debt, quite often have impacts that cannot be foreseen. And it is precisely for those reasons that we have Parliament, so we can test those, so that we can amend them. And we know, quite simply, that secondary legislation does not afford Parliament the same benefits in terms of interrogating legislation and critically amending it, let alone taking evidence that primary legislation does. Would it not have been better to have those things published and properly scrutinised by the Committee in this Stage 1 report, rather than waiting till after the event? So can I just say that while we absolutely commend the intent of this, the broad purposes of this Bill, I think, more uh, importantly, I have huge concerns about this in terms of a way of legislating and, indeed, whether or not it leaves open a wide open door for governments that may not have the benign intent that this one claims to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Could I please remind all members who are seeking to speak in the debate to please ensure that they have checked that they have, in fact, pressed the request to speak buttons. And with that, we move to the open debate and I call on Colin Beattie to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Mr Beattie. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate, on st debate in Stage 1 Bankruptcy Indulgence Scotland Bill, most particularly as I'm a member of the Economy and Fair Work Committee which considered this bill. The objectives of the bill seem quite simple. Many of the changes are very much of a technical and minor nature which appear to require little debate. However, the major area which has been the focus of attention is the changes which are intended to help and improve the lives of people who are struggling with problem debt and have serious mental health issues. And this is the area where I'll primarily focus on. In principle, the proposal to provide a moratorium to give breathing space for those who have serious mental problems would give them a chance to recover and to better handle their situation when they're able to do so. But there are a number of issues which need considered to ensure fairness and justice. As we now know, people with mental health problems are three and a half times more likely to be in debt, and half the people who are in problem debt are experiencing a mental health problem. The cost of living crisis has exacerbated the link between money issues and mental health, and while this bill is focused on the more extreme side of the scale, research from the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute shows that one in six adults in the UK have experienced suicidal thoughts due to the cost of living crises. This makes it very clear why this proposed bill is a necessary one. The current legal framework for statutory debt solutions allows people in debt, in including those with mental health issues, 
to apply for a six-month moratorium against diligence, giving someone with debt problems time to consider the best solution to their financial situation. During this time, the debtors are expected to continue making payments towards any debts due while the moratorium is in place. But the moratorium prevents creditors from taking particular forms of recovery actions for a set period of time. Section 1 of this bill would give ministers power to make regulations to introduce a mental health moratorium. There is little included which indicates how the moratorium would actually work, and while leaving the detail to the regulations will allow flexibility to adapt legislation to changes, it does mean that specifics of how this will work are not set out. Clearly, eligibility is a key factor. It seems likely that those who are subject to a compulsory treatment order under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 would be eligible, and also those receiving treatment under the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. After that, it becomes less clear, and understandably so. Mental health is a complex business, and there must be a clear line in this bill as to who is eligible without grey areas or ambiguity. In England, uh, the debt respite scheme breathing space criteria is wider than the proposals put forward by the Scottish Government. Breathing space is open to anyone who is receiving mental health crisis treatment. And perhaps the Scottish Government will consider using a similar criteria going forward. This would cover people receiving crisis treatment, which would include those receiving compulsory treatment, as well as those who are receiving crises, emergency or acute treatment without compulsion. There is also the question of who would sign off on such a mental health moratorium. The Scottish Government's consultation proposes that eligibility to sign off would be certified by a mental health officer, reporting medical officer, a community psychiatric nurse or a similarly qualified professional, and this seems reasonable. But there has also been some debate on the length of the moratorium, and again I think that the Government proposals that the initial stage of the moratorium should last as long as the person is receiving treatment, followed by a six-month follow-on period to allow the person to deal with their debt problems is reasonable. My only question being, what happens if the person has a long-term condition, or indeed a permanent condition? What is the backstop to deal with that? Details remain to be seen as to how the actual freeze will work. How will diligence be stopped? I assume interest will be frozen and creditor contact ceased. And I look forward to more information on this as the bill progresses. Other... Stephen Kerr. Does he also share concerns that I have and other people have expressed about the government's stated intention to create a public register of those who would make use of the scheme? No such criteria exists in England and Wales. Does he agree with me that they ought not to exist in Scotland? And in terms of stigma, it's very important that this is handled very sensitively. Colin Beattie. I recognise the sensitivity of the, the public register. Um, I think that uh, there will be further debate and discussion on that going forward. The other concerns exist that this mental health moratorium may put additional pressures on an already stretched money advice sector. While it's not anticipated there will be an enormous volume of debtors availing themselves of this facility, there will be a need for practitioners across the entire debt advice sector to receive appropriate training and education to ensure that the best possible advice is given, and there may well be a cost attached to this. And just to add to the complexity of this area, there are many individuals subject to a compulsory treatment order who have appointed an individual as their power of attorney to handle their affairs when necessary. So is it then necessary to restrict this service only to those who have mental capacity to consent and those who have legally rec recognised representatives? What happens to those in debt who do not have that capacity? I'll just briefly run through one or two other points uh, uh, arising from the bill. The minimum asset process bankruptcy is a way to bankruptcy for individual debtors with a low income and few assets. And currently, one can only apply for such a bankruptcy every 10 years. And the suggestion is that this be reduced to five years. There are mixed views on this, with some stakeholders supporting and some rejecting. And I think far more work needs to be done to ensure that the appropriate period is uh, fixed on. So, I see I'm running out of time, so I'll just uh, run forward. I, I look forward again to seeing further information on the detail of the bill in the further stages as it goes forward.
But in the meantime, the intentions of the Bill are beneficial to creditors who suffer from serious mental health problems and offer a fair option in difficult circumstances for both creditors and debtors. And uh, I, I obviously support the general principles of the Bill. Thank you, Mr Beattie. And I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Mr Kerr. Uh, President officer, it is a pleasure to follow uh, Colin Beatty, who I think gave a considered and thoughtful speech highlighting many of the issues of concern about the bill that I wish to reiterate. This, is, uh, this pro proposed legislation is a bill with good intentions. Of, of that, there is no doubt. And I'm sure it will have a unanimous support across the chamber when we get to decision time this evening. But it is severely lacking in detail. Uh, what exactly are we to scrutinise today? in this stage one debate. The idea that we ought to take a view about modernising our law in relation to how we treat people who are suffering severe mental health issues in relation to their financial affairs. Surely we would all agree with that, but surely, but surely also when we've got a bill in front of us, we should be looking more to the substance of what's being proposed to deal with the issue. Now, Myrtle Fraser has said that we on these benches will support the bill. As I say, I think it will be unanimously, I hope, supported. But we need more detail. News laws cannot just be made casually. Now, we, we don't have a great reputation in this Parliament for making solid and robust law. We don't have a revising chamber. We have got to get to the detail of, this, of, of any bill so that we don't produce bad or weak law. We should be very, very wary of rubber stamping such vague bills as the bill that's in front of us this afternoon. For example, who is to be helped? How are they to be helped? How long are they to be helped for? What mechanisms will be used to provide the help? We've no idea about what additional resources will be required in a public sense or indeed in a private sense to be able to fulfil the requirements of the bill because they just don't exist as specific, substantial details. So we are all left to discuss today in a worthy principle, let I say, everyone in the chamber already agrees on it, namely that we should update our existing bankruptcy legislation, introduce some mental health moratorium um, uh, for people suffering from mental health issues. But I just don't think uh, that we should accept any provisions that emerge on the basis of this bill that leave at-risk Scots in a less protected position than people in England and Wales. I'm afraid, I hope none of us would support a bill or the details of any bill that would leave our citizens in a worse off position than their fellows in the rest of the United Kingdom. And that's what I fear we will see happen. If the Scottish Government, as is its, as is its pattern, accepts the recommendations of its own working group, specifically in terms of the entry criteria, well covered, and I congratulate the convener and the committee for the excellent stage one report they produced. That's well covered in paragraph 50 of their report, as is, and in paragraph 72, the scope of the protections. And the request of the Economy and Fair Work Committee in paragraph 76, if the minister wants to look it up, uh, I think the minister should agree to that today. He should agree today to commit to uh, the request of the uh, committee. And the reason I um, ha have to ask this is because there's nothing in the bill which spells out the detail that we are all badly missing. So section one of this bill gives ministers, and I quote, power by regulations to establish a moratorium on debt recovery action in relation to individuals who have a mental illness. But the policy memorandum produced by the minister goes even further, produces it more succinctly, further work, this is the quote, further work will be taken forward within government and with stakeholders to develop the details of the scheme, which will cover specific areas such as the criteria for entry to and ex exit from a moratorium, the specific protections afforded by a moratorium and the duration of those protections. So the substance of the bill is still to be worked out. And therefore our role as parliamentarians in scrutinising what the government is proposing is largely fatuous. But I have to say this is a familiar trick from the SNP and Scottish Greens in office. They bring forward framework legislation which empowers ministers, and I think Daniel Johnson's right to highlight his concerns, which we should all share about the extent of those powers, sounded very like Henry VIII powers to me as he read them, uh, read that section of the bill. 
but they bring forward framework legislation, empowering ministers that, yes, of course. Alistair Allen. Could, could we please have Dr Allen's microphone? Or could... We still... I listen to what the member is saying, my apologies, um, uh, about framework uh, legislation. Uh, he, he does kind of present it as if this is a uniquely Scottish phenomenon. I mean, would he not acknowledge that framework legislation is a feature of, of legislation in Westminster as well? Stephen Kerr. I'm not presenting it as anything of the sort. I mean, I don't like framework legislation, whoever produces it. I just happen to think that the government party that Alistair Allen's a member of produces more of this stuff than is palatable, frankly, yeah. in a parliament where we should yeah. be scrutinising uh, the substance of detail. And empowering ministers all the time to introduce the detail of secondary legislation. But we all know this parliament can barely cope with the secondary legislation it already has. More and more secondary legislation with, with a completely inadequate means of scrutinising. It yeah. couldn't be called robust the way that we deal with secondary legislation. I'm happy to give way to Keith Brown. Keith Brown. Can I thank uh, Stephen Kerr for giving way? Just given the contempt which is repeatedly shown in his speech for the ability of this Parliament to legislate and the unjustifiable faith he has in the Westminster system to graduate and his description of this fatuous nature, how can he possibly be considering voting for this today? Yeah, exactly. Stephen Kerr. I don't know if Keith Brown is listening at all. I, I didn't mention anything about Westminster. I didn't hold up Westminster in terms... In fact, I said the opposite. I said, I said very clearly to Alistair Allen, I yeah. don't like framework legislation, whoever produces it, because, frankly, I think the whole point of government is to be... of this parliament is to be a counterweight yeah. to the executive. Exactly. We shouldn't be trusting in ministers to yeah. produce detail in secondary legislation when no parliament... No Parliament, Keith Brown, has the capacity to properly scrutinise yeah. secondary legislation. Yeah. Have you to give way? Uh, Minister? I just want to clarify, Mr Kerr in his remarks has been keen to stress the importance of parity uh, with the position within the rest of the UK. The, reg the scheme that he speaks of so favourably was made under regulations, under provisions similar to a framework bill. So I'm not really unsure what the particular issue is that he's trying to address, particularly given when it's receiving evidence, the position that the government has set out of determining this through regulations was supported by citizens advice. Stephen Kerr. Well, once again, I have no idea. I'm delighted to hear how the SNP hold Westminster up as somehow the standard against everything we do in this parliament has to be measured. My goodness me, this is a breakthrough moment for the union. Wow. that the SNP set their stall out on the basis of what happens in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And, uh, of wow. course, the former uh, leader of the SNP at Westminster is desperate to get in the House of Lords. Maybe that's, maybe that's because he also has such a high feeling, high esteem for, for Westminster. Well, well, the fact is that um, secondary legislation is an inadequate way of bringing forward these sorts of measures. They should, as Fergus Ewing rightly says, Taken. I've been very generous. Uh, please bring your remarks to close within the next 30 you seconds. Thank more. you very much. <laughs> I will close in the next 30 seconds. Let me just, let me just, I, I, there were lots more to be said about secondary legislation, but I respect the fact I don't have the time. So let me just conclude uh, by, by, by saying why I'm voting for the bill. I think Keith Brown might be w interested yeah. to listen to this. And, and the reason I do it is because there are some worthy things in the bill. Uh, in an ever-changing society, the, the imperative of dynamic legal frameworks is self-evident and it's incumbent upon us as legislators to ensure our legislative framework adapts to, con to continue to M provide Mr. fair Kerr, I think and the efficient 30 solutions. 30 seconds have passed, but thank you very much. I think we get the general hardship. just thank you, Mr. Thank Kerr. Thank you very much, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy. Kerr. I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Mr. Stewart. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, President Officer, and uh, I'm very pleased to support the general principles of the bill today. Um, I joined the uh, committee uh, when it was uh, uh, partway through its deliberations, but I find uh, all of this uh, scrutiny very, very interesting indeed. Um, and I would like to thank all of those who have engaged uh, with the committee. And in particular, um, I'd like to thank the minister for listening. Uh, because one of the uh, difficulties that I had uh, around about what we were doing here 
was that there had not been enough engagement, in my opinion, with the voices of lived experience. And I'm glad that the Minister has put that to rights uh, and that the voices of lived experience will also uh, be heard when it comes uh, to uh, the formatting of the regulations. Uh, the bill will bring forward stakeholder-led recommendations to introduce improvements uh, to current insolvency solutions and debt recovery processes. And stakeholders and those with practical experience in both the money advice and mental health sectors considered, consider that there is a strong link between problem debt and poor mental health. Uh, poor mental health can both cause and be caused by uh, problem debt. And poor mental health can impact an individual's ability to manage their money or to make sound financial judgments and decisions or to maintain employment and a, reg a regular income that can service debt. The Royal College of S Psychiatrists reports that one in two adults uh, with debt has a mental health problem. Half uh, of adults with a mental health problem have debt. And one in four people with a mental health problem um, is also uh, in debt. And experience in the money advice sector also shows that individuals with mental health problems often do not seek early he help with debt issues, uh, which may be attributed uh, to a stigma surrounding mental ill health. This can lead to problems worsening before action is taken. It is also uh, generally acknowledged that the threat of creditor action or pressure from creditors can exacerbate existing mental health issues. Good resources already exist, presiding officer, uh, for creditors, including Citizens Advice Scotland's Mental Health uh, and Money Good Practice Guidance for Creditors. But as we know, good advice is often ignored. And the bill will bring forward stakeholder-led recommendations to introduce improvements to current insolvency solutions and debt recovery processes. Its aim is to help and improve the lives of people who are struggling with debt, which may be, again, exacerbated by uh, the difficulties that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and more efficient recovery processes will assist businesses and local authorities to collect debts from those who can pay. The measures in the bill have been and are being very much designed with and by the stakeholder community, which I think is extremely important. And I recognise that this bill is only one part of a programme of work to improve bankruptcy and diligence. The Scottish Government will introduce changes through secondary legislation, some of which it is hoped and I hope will be laid before Parliament during the progress of this bill. And the Government has also commissioned a longer term review to assess how far current statutory solutions meet the needs of a modern economy. Um, and I'm glad uh, that the Minister has mentioned Yvonne McDermott, who has accepted an appointment to lead stage three of that wider review. Uh, and there will be some matters that merit further consideration, I'm sure, as part of that review. Out with the scope of the bill. I hope that the Scottish Government will take cognizance of the work done in Lord John Scott's Mental Health Law Review and to take the advice of many, many stakeholders to re uh, remove all of the current discriminatory terminology that currently exists in legislation <laughs> to describe people who have poor mental health. Um, phrases such as severely mentally impaired, uh, which is used in the council tax legislation, which has been mentioned by other members, is outdated, uh, antiquated, uh, and severely stigmatising to many people. And, and I recognise that the work to change that legislation will take time. But it is absolutely galling that stigmatising language still exists in legislation. Uh, and I know that some of this law has existed for decades or even centuries, 
But this stigmatizing language must be cast into the dustbin of history once and for all. Uh, and here is where I disagree um, with some of the contributions today uh, around about legislating. Um, because there are many people in this place that believe that everything should be in primary legislation. Yeah. I do not. I believe that we have as a, a role uh, as parliamentarians to scrutinise uh, not only primary legislation, but to scrutinise secondary legislation. And there is the ability to do that in this place. And if there were more opportunities to put certain aspects into secondary legislation, then we would not have to deal with the phrases of decades and centuries ago. It would have been easier to put phrases like severely mentally impaired into the dustbin of history a long while ago if those phrases had been in secondary rather than primary legislation. Uh, and I'm sure that that is something that we could all agree upon in terms of modernising uh, legislation and guidance as we go forward. Uh, President officer, uh, for me, uh, the key aspect of getting us this right is listening to the voices of lived experience. I'm very pleased that the Minister has agreed to do so uh, and that the Government will take their, for their views forward as they progress uh, with the regulation stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Carol Mocking. Mr Ewing. Uh, presiding officer, um, I first apologise for being late because of an unavoidably being detained on a personal matter. Um, it uh, was, I think, in the 70s that I first read a reflection that the late distinguished, very first First Minister of Scotland made at that point, which was that Scotland was the only country in the world with her own legal system, but which lacked a legislature. And he believed profoundly that this parliament should exist to fill that gap, to remove that anomaly, so that we could make laws in Scotland and do so regularly, and not in the form of Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act, which was the case before devolution. And I think we all support that. But at the heart of this debate, I think really is crystallizing a very simple question. How do we make good law? How do we avoid passing law which may have unintended consequences? And how best do we achieve that? Uh, and yes, framework bills are not helpful to that. But as Mr. Stewart has just said, you can't put everything in the face of a bill. There is a happy medium, perhaps, to be, to be grasped here. I don't think, with respect to the Minister, that he's achieved that. Um, not many people will remember the Scottish Law Commission bankruptcy report of 1982 being something of an anorak in bankruptcy law. I do. And it led to the 85 Act, which was a, a model of clarity and served Scotland well for, for many years. See, the accounts of bankruptcy uh, inclined to nod, I think, at that point. Um, but it made one big mistake, which was to create a mechanism whereby people with no assets and very modest debts could be made bankrupt with accountancies practices receiving a very large payment which often exceeded the amount of the debt. The estimated cost of this was £250,000 because George Leslie Kerr, a friend of mine, the accountant of bankruptcy, envisaged only business bankruptcies but this created a market so that people in the schemes went bankrupt so that accountants could get a handsome fee. It ended up, presiding officer, that the cost of this was £20 million. And as it happened, I ran a campaign with Tom Shields of the then Herald Diary and the tacit support of Leslie Kerr. I hope he doesn't mind that slight breach of etiquette at this point. And we got it stopped. And to be fair, Michael Forsyth, who passed the Bankruptcy of Scotland Act 1993, credited me with perhaps the momentum to end that abuse of public funds. It served no purpose at all. Uh, and it was ended. Um, I just mentioned that because unintended consequences are a big issue. Now, I spent... Um, over 20 years as a solicitor and about 10 years as an accredited specialist in bankruptcy law and uh, rightly or wrongly I acted mainly for the debtor and mainly for businesses that were about to or had basically finished uh, and cases where there was usually a family home owned by the debtor 
family, children, all of whom were innocent. And what I wanted to put across was this, that this was high-octane stuff. Every single business that was facing serious debt problems had a main person, usually a male, in charge. And that person was under enormous pressure. It's hard to convey just how much mental stress many of my clients were under. And my job was often to preserve the family home by raising a mortgage. If a family member had a job, they could raise a mortgage, buy out the interest in the account of bankruptcy, hopefully at a relatively modest amount. They weren't supposed to do that, but that was often done, which was good grace and path, path of enlightened trustees. Yes, of course I will. Brian Russell. I'm very grateful for the member for giving the intervention. Very interested to hear his, his comments on this and his experience. I wonder if, uh, you know, as an aside, does he think that because of the, the fees that, that can be commanded uh, by those uh, administrators, we actually put uh, people into bankruptcy too easily? Bergesheen. I think there's a, an element to that, but I just wanted to finish the point I was making, if I may, which is that very many of these people who faced loss of their business, loss of their dignity, loss of their status, loss of their self-esteem and their self-worth, were under incredible stress. And very often they didn't have any mental problems, but I could sense, as a non-expert, entire layperson, that they were now beginning to suffer from mental stress because of the extreme pressure which they faced. In fact, I can't think of anyone who perhaps was absolutely rational at all times in these situations. It's very hard to do that. The point I'm making, Minister, is this, that if we create this measure and the clarity of the criteria, the gatekeeping, is not crystal clear, then it's just human nature that people who want more time will say, well, I, I do have mental illness. Now, of course, there's a mental health uh, sign-off process, paragraph 57 of the... Um, of the report deals with that, and that's quite right. But that may not be an impediment to those who are determined to get a pause, and, and why should it? And if they do have a mental health issue, fine. But the potential for abuse seems to me to be here. And it is our duty as legislators to deal with that. Can I make a few other short points? We've got an excellent scheme called the Debt Arrangement Scheme, which is a debt payment plan. I think we are a bit ahead of England, or at least we were in my time, and... Uh, the, the current bankruptcy is nodding, so that must, point must be true. Um, but I wonder if there's not an alternative just to encourage greater take-up of the DAS, because it's a diligence stopper. It freezes interest. Uh, very often it can actually reduce the quantum debt which is paid. Would that not be an alternative, perhaps, which could be used by widening the circumstances in which DAS is available? I won't go into more technicalities. I don't have the time. Um, so, you know, so the problems of definition, I think, are, are acute. I think there's a case, perhaps, for following the English example, though not perfect, because it has been tried and over a relatively short period and perhaps tested to some, uh, to, to some extent. There's also the question about what protections will there be? As one of the point, points was made at the committee, where's the meat and the bone? Unless you know what the protections are, the whole thing is hopelessly nebulous. Is it about the total amount of debt? Is it the length of repayment? Is it the length of the pause? And there does need to be clarity for the creditor point of view. Not all creditors are rich or government, although most are. Uh, yes, I'll take the Minister if I have time. Uh, uh, briefly, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm very mm -hmm. grateful to uh, Fergus Shearing for his very considered contribution, bringing his vast experience to bear in this. One of the distinctions between the proposed mental health moratorium and the existing moratorium is the two aspects of it particularly the mental health treatment phase, which is indefinite. And the criteria as originally proposed were for alignment with existing mental health statute. I'm wondering if the member has any particular reflections on that. He has raised, I think, concerns about potential abuse. Does he think such a, there is such a criteria that can give confidence in terms of having that indefinite protection of moratorium? Uh, briefly in response, Mr. Ewing. Uh, yeah, br briefly, I, I do wish the Minister well. But my main point is that I do think that these are difficult questions and postponing them till a later date doesn't seem to me to be the right solution. If they can be answered prior to stage three, I, I think that really would be doing Parliament a service and it would potentially, Minister, perhaps risk, uh, avoid the risks uh, which I have identified as potential risks becoming 
actual one. So I, I wish him well in the task that I once pursued, uh, and uh, I, I very much hope that he'll give some thought to the points I've made this afternoon. Thank you, Mr Ewing. I now call uh, Carol Mockin to be followed by Keith Brown. Ms Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like other members, can I thank the committee and the clerks for preparing the Stage 1 report um, on what is a really important piece of legislation that is very helpful for those of us who were not part of the committee considering this, um, that the report was so well put together. As has been mentioned, and I want to add that I personally very much support legislation which would act actively seek to support debt management strategies, and I think the convener clear um, it, it set out very well the, the contributions that this piece of legislation could make. And possibly it might be helpful to add in that I, I don't think I've read anything or spoken to anyone that suggests that some of the things that have been talked about by other members has ever really been uh, seen as something that would be abused, but more as a positive step. Um, so, uh, as my colleague has said, Scottish Labour will support this legislation at stage one this evening, as we do agree with its general principles and aims. The introduction and legislation of a mental health moratorium is welcome, and it is right that those suffering from poor mental health are provided with those greater protections that all members have been speaking about. Having read the Stage 1 report, the evidence and the SPICE report amongst discussion with, with people on the committee, it is clear that this would be a positive and welcome step. Um, and as I have said, it is, um, Lab Scottish Labour is also supportive of the proposed two-stage approach to the moratorium period with an open-ended first phase, allowing an individual to fo focus on recovery from a serious mental health condition rather than exacerbating the problem with continuous debt worries. Prioritising the mental health of the individual in such situations is of paramount importance, as other members have said, speaking to people with that lived experience. And we, again, we do believe we have found common ground with the government in this area. As you know, citizens' advice bureaus across the country provide high-quality debt advice free of charge and to people in their time of need. Um, when they say, and I quote, we must recognise that when someone has a mental health crisis or when their mental health is so bad that they need to take time out and pause, that is not the time to think about their debts. We ought to listen, um, and that means not only establishing this moratorium in legislation, but explaining how it will operate in practice. And that has been some of the questions that members have had for the government so far. President officer, it is on this point, as has been noted, that I find myself in full agreement with the committee's recommendations, as my colleague also mentioned, Scottish Labour shares the committee's concerns on the lack of detail on how the moratorium will operate in practice and its view that there must be sufficient time to scrutinise detailed proposals, and that would be helpful, as all or many of the other members have said. The bill leaves a lot to, of detail to be laid out in regulation and these should be provided in draft form before Stage 3. Now, I appreciate in his letter to the committee responding to the Stage 1 report, the Minister does acknowledge the committee's concerns and suggests that he will seek to address them moving forward. So I look forward to his uh, comments on that. But I think it is important to note the contributions given by South Lanarkshire Council during the evidence-taking process. And it noted, and I quote, um, it therefore is not clear at this point who will be able to use a mental health moratorium, how an application will be made and what effect it will have or how long it will last. So I think um, for those who will be in a position of having to deal with this, it would be very helpful for them. For them. There is undoubtedly a concern. Um, the Scottish Government have set out a well-intentioned um, you know, and I believe well-supported proposal, but where it lacks detail, I think it is fair to say there is still a fair amount of work to be done to address these concerns uh, raised by the committee and by other stakeholders and members in the chamber today. Furthermore, eligibility in relation to the moratorium is another clear area where we believe the Scottish Government ought to re revisit its position. As it stands, only those receiving compulsory treatment would be eligible for mental health moratorium. And I, and I know a couple of the members mentioned this um, and are far more familiar, perhaps, with the exact wording. Um, but 
my understanding is the approach is, the approach is thought to be not proportionate to the scale of the problem. Um, and I agree with the committee's proposal that the criteria should be whitened. Um, and I, you know, I, I think going back to a statement I made earlier um, on as I started is that I think that clearer terms for this so that people understand that would be helpful, but also an understanding that there's never been any evidence from other areas that this has been um, widely abused or anything. So I think it, it would be helpful and it, and it can be managed well. Um, as the Minister notes, notes in his response to the Stage 1 report, early indications from consultation did suggest that, is an, that this was an area of legislation where support was not widespread and concerns were held around the entry criteria. Um, and as I've said, it is welcome that the Minister has recognised these concerns and um, will we'll move forward with them. Um, in calling for his extension of eligibility, eligibility, we do recognise that this would require an expansion of debt advice services. And I think other members have mentioned this, that it's all very well for us to recognise um, that we might want to change the legislation, but we know that debt advice services are quite stretched. Those working in the debt advice sector are already working to capacity. They must be given the training and the support required to properly deliver these reforms as they come through the different stages and, and, and are passed in the Parliament. Systems Advice Scotland believe that there should be more partnership working across both mental health and money advice services, and I think a lot of members would agree with this. This could be achieved by example of embedding money advice services in mental health settings or working closely with local community teams, local community groups, and that this is an important part of um, any legislation is how it actually works uh, in practice. The community-based approach can be applied across various disciplines and to tackle various issues, but I am strongly of the opinion that this is a key area where our communities and those most in need would feel the benefits. Um, I wanted to just mention as well, presiding officer, that the points about the uprating um, of the allowances um, that was mentioned by the convener I think are quite important. I haven't got time really to go into them myself. But not being on the committee and coming to, to the papers and reading about it, I think that would be an important thing for the government to, to look at as well. In concluding, I reiterate my party's support for the general principles of this legislation. The key aims of the bill are well intentioned and has been mentioned. Um, the aims are shared across the chamber and we have identified that stakeholders broadly support that. So I hope that the minister will address some of the issues that have been raised by the committee and by members in the chamber today. And I again thank the clerks and the committee for the stage one report. Thank, thank, thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, I now call Keith Brown to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Mr Brown. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. We have heard some uh, interesting and informed contributions, first of all, Murdo Fraser, from his experience as somebody that is legally qualified from Fergus Ewing, both as somebody legally qualified and has been a practitioner in this area in the past, and from Colin Beattie with his financial expertise. But I was going to concentrate a little more on the general situation which has given rise to the need for this bill, in my view, and some of the general points which underlie the general principles, which is the subject of a stage one uh, debate. We are currently living through two uh, major crises that are absolutely dominating the quality of life in our country, and that's the cost of living crisis, including something we don't talk about so much anymore, the cost of energy crisis, uh, and the mental health crisis, two problems which are made uh, worse by each other. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, also Russia's invasion of Ukraine, has helped unleash economic uncertainty across the world, and this is particularly true in Scotland, where the additional uncertainty and the massive costs of Brexit have wreaked even more havoc on the economy, impacting businesses, employment and individuals across the country. And these factors have contributed to uh, producing a cost of living crisis that is pushing many Scottish households into financial destitution. For some, unsustainable debt has become a very unfortunate consequence of this, and we all know the strain, as we've heard, that that can place on a person's mental health. And Scotland is in the midst of a rapidly worsening debt crisis, with a report published by Step Change, Scotland's debt charity, showing a 27 per cent increase in average unsecured debt levels in just one year, rising from £12,730 in 2021 to £16,174 in 2022. 
Uh, for that reason, presiding officer, this bill could not be more timely, given its central aim of alleviating, in a small way, the struggles of grappling with debt and potential bankruptcy, two challenges often compounded by mental health issues. It is worth mentioning, however, that the changes to debt enforcement rules in the bill are not hugely dramatic or, as we have heard, particularly contentious, but pragmatic, and all the measures in this bill have undergone public consultation at least once and have received broad support. They would require transparency from entities like banks or employers regarding unsuccessful attempts to arrest their debtors' assets, while also ensuring the debtors themselves are entitled to a debt advice and information package ahead of relevant hearings, among other changes. And they are fairly straightforward changes, ensuring greater transparency for all involved. There was an interesting question raised by Stephen Kerr in relation to Colin Beattie's comment about a register. Um, and, of course, unless any of the lawyers present want to correct me, I think it is the case that bankruptcy is always public and transparent, whereas this would be a public register, which would also include references to people's mental health. So I would kind of share that concern. I would be interested to see how the government uh, manages to reconcile the issue between uh, the impact on individuals of having their mental health situation made public and the need for transparency. Uh, Scotland has always had distinct laws from the rest of the UK regarding debt recovery, and I believe that this bill signals the beginning of a more compassionate and humanistic approach to debt recovery in the country, one which protects the dignity of our fellow Scots when they are at their most vulnerable. Uh, this is further shown by the mental health moratorium which the bill proposes, which would provide individuals with serious mental health issues regarding legal protection and a freeze on debt enforcement actions. One of the most uh, important actions that can be taken to try and alleviate the stress and the impact on someone's mental health. A shield to protect their citizens when they're potentially at their most vulnerable. I do take on board the points made by a number of members about the need for more specificity, and I do not um, envy the Minister's task in trying to get something which is objective and which might satisfy some of the concerns already expressed. But that specific tool, um, recommended by the working group in the development of the bill, recognises the strong link between problem debt and poor mental health. Uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists reports that half of adults with debts face mental health issues, as we have heard, while one in four individuals with mental health problems is in debt. So there is clearly a symbiotic relationship between debt and poor mental health. And as lawmakers, we need to make laws that reflect that. The Bill's significance lies in that commitment to improving our existing system to protect the most vulnerable at a time when it is truly needed. It is also important to remember that this Bill is under consideration today and it represents only one aspect of a broader programme dedicated to improving how we deal with bankruptcy and diligence. And it is my understanding, again, as we have heard, that the Scottish Government intends to introduce additional changes through secondary legislation, a perfectly proper, legitimate and transparent process, which is subject to democratic scrutiny, uh, with some secondary legislation expected to be laid before Parliament during the course of this Bill's progression. And further to this, I understand the Scottish Government has undertaken a longer-term review to assess the adequacy of current statutory solutions in the increasingly challenging time in which we live, so we can continue to ensure that we are providing the necessary protection and support to guide individuals out of the throes of problem debt. There has been some discussion as to whether we simply mirror what happens in England and Wales in many of the important respects. I think there are important ways in which debt collection, in particular in Scotland, is much more humane uh, and has developed over time. And I do not think we should throw that uh, baby out with the bathwater, nor do I think it is a, a good course of action to denigrate this Parliament and simply say, let us do what is done by another Parliament. I have confidence in both the Government and the Parliament's ability to legislate properly in this area. So, to conclude, Presiding Officer, let our decisions on this bill reflect our commitment to improve the current system along compassionate lines. It is a different world that we live in now from which we lived in, in very recently in terms of the prevalence of mental uh, health, many of, many of the instances of which are due to the pandemic. And let's also build an effective legal framework. And as I said earlier, this changes, the changes in the legislation have already received broad support from the public. So let's make sure it receives broad support from this parliament as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Brown. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Emma Harper. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are all well aware, I think, that the actions we take and decisions we make can change people's lives. Some of what we do might seem small and insignificant. And yes, some of those things might be small, but they could have significant, positive impacts on a few people's lives. 
I think this Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill will be exactly that. In the midst of technical changes to our bankruptcy laws is the potential to make the lives of people who are struggling with debt and poor mental health much more manageable. So on behalf of the Scottish Greens, I welcome this legislation. I'd like to thank all of those individuals and organisations who contributed in various ways to the Economy and Fair Work Committee's scrutiny of this bill. I appreciate the consideration and time devoted to helping us get to grips with the details of the proposals in the bill. And I'm especially grateful to those who have challenged us to be bolder and to go further, to deliver benefits to even more people who are struggling with poor mental health and debt issues. Like many others this afternoon, I will focus my remarks on the provisions relating to the mental health moratorium. Debt has a huge impact on mental health. This was made very clear to us by participants in the engagement session we held with One Parent Families and the Poverty Alliance. The personal stories of mental health issues spiralling out of control because of the pressures of debts, alongside other issues associated with family, work, physical health and so on, were emotive and very affecting. As Becca Stacey from the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute said too, we know that people with mental health problems are three and a half times more likely to be in debt, and half of the people who are in problem debt are experiencing a mental health problem. So it's a vicious circle, debt and poor mental health being clearly linked and reinforcing. It is also clear that despite the work undertaken to shift perceptions and actions taken by creditors when dealing with people suffering from mental health issues, some still continue to demand repayments. Common debts or council tax, benefits overpayments, overdrafts and utilities. Given, that public sector or publicly given the public sector or publicly regulated nature of these, this is very disappointing. Some creditors also insist on ongoing payments even if repayment of the debt is never likely to be complete. Yes. Fergus Ewing. I have a constituent who is a, a cleaner, works for the public services, and inherited a small amount of money from his parents, which he used to buy a f flat to rent out. His tenant has, hasn't paid the, re the rent for a very long period of time, and has said he's not doing so because he knows he can't be evicted. My, my constituent, thus, is in a situation of facing himself severe mental stress. He's not wealthy, he's a creditor. So it's a two-way street, isn't it? We've got to have, surely, a balanced system. Otherwise, society and contracts don't function as they should. Maggie Chapman, I can give you the time back. Thanks very much, presiding officer. I, th I think uh, Fergus Ewing raises an, an interesting, uh, interesting point, to, but to try and bring tenants' rights into this debate, I, th I think, is, is maybe a little, a little bit shy of the mark. We need to make sure that society as a whole supports everybody and that homes are for living in, not for making profit. People struggling with debt in told us in committee that they also now get repeated contact by, from creditors by texts, emails, as well as letters, sometimes on a daily basis. Such pressures can only add to stress and anxiety, even if the communications were not threatening. The incessant demands and pressures have significant negative impacts on people's well-being. For these and other reasons, the introduction of powers to create a mental health moratorium is very welcome. Having a clear mechanism to ensure creditors cease diligence proceedings while someone focuses on improving their mental health is necessary. I look forward to further discussions on potentially freezing interest repayment charges, restricting contact from the creditor, and the like. I support calls to include these informal forms of debt enforcement in the moratorium. As we've heard, this bill is enabling legislation, with details of the mental health moratorium to be determined by regulations currently being developed following the conclusion of the, the recent consultation. I welcome the Minister's commitment to keep the committee informed as regulations are developed so that we can effectively scrutinise them. And I believe that we will effectively scrutinise those. The significant area of concern with the moratorium proposal is that eligibility criteria are drawn far too narrowly. We heard from many witnesses and people with lived experience that many people who do not have compulsory treatment orders would benefit from accessing the much-needed support under this moratorium. 
We've heard already this afternoon details of alternative approaches for widening the eligibility criteria, so I won't rehearse those here. But I, I, and I do appreciate that the Minister has said more time is required to analyse consultation responses on this issue. I hope we can agree wider criteria as this bill progresses through subsequent stages. I think there is general agreement, certainly on the committee, for that. Linked to this, though, I do not agree with the view held by some, including that expressed in the consultation document on the operation of the moratorium, that, and I quote, we should start small, make sure the scheme works properly, and then consider expanding it once we have sufficient experience under our belts, end quote. This approach risks, I think, the success of the scheme as a whole. If only a handful of people can benefit from a moratorium because of the tightness of the eligibility criteria, then we won't actually get the evidence or experience we need or understand where it is failing. We don't want this legislation to fall flat at this first hurdle. On other proposals contained within the bill, I share the concerns expressed by many this afternoon about the creation of a public register and the stigma associated with this. I look for forward to further information on this from the Minister in due course. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to look for an opportunity to amend the stigmatising phrase, severely mentally impaired. I echo the calls from financial advice and support organisations and others to ensure that frontline debt advisors and mental health professionals get the appropriate specialist trauma-informed training and support required to ensure they are adequately equipped to support people struggling with both mental ill health and debt. I don't have time to address all the other proposals in the bill, so in closing, presiding officer, I thank the convener and the other colleagues on the Economy and Fair Work Committee for the work undertaking on this bill to date. I thank the clerks for pulling together everything we've discussed, and I look forward to our future discussions on that detail that we've talked so much about this afternoon in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Pam Gosler in six minutes. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak at the debate. I'm not a member of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, but I do have an interest in ensuring that we get a bankruptcy and insolvency. We have to get it right for people in communities across Scotland who are facing financial harm. I therefore welcome that this bill will bring forward stakeholder-led recommendations to introduce improvements to current insolvency solutions and debt recovery processes. And I thank all the committees and the members of the committees and the clerks for their scrutiny and everybody for their, their uh, providing evidence as we take forward this legislation. Countries around the world have been facing unprecedented challenges and a strain on their economies in recent times, and Scotland has not been immune to this, not least from the Conservative created cost of living crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic introduced a huge uncertainty with a far-reaching impact on business and employment arrangements for thousands of people in Scotland. And now that we're in the midst of this cost of living crisis, placing many households under extreme financial difficulty. Unfortunately for many, unsustainable debt will be the regrettable consequence. And it is right that the process with which, that we put in place to address this are adequate and that to treat people fairly. It is essential that we look to maximise the effectiveness of our systems that provide the necessary protection and support to help all those people to navigate their way out of the pressure of problem debt. We have good mechanisms in Scotland with far-sighted reforms, including the 2015 Placing High Quality Consumer Debt Advice at the centre of the system. The debt arrangement scheme has been a major success and remains the UK's only statutory debt repayment solution. Reforms introduced immediately prior to the onset of the pandemic have been an enabler for the scheme to grow, allowing more people to take control of their debt through a manageable payment programme. The Scottish Government committed to a policy review of Scotland's statutory debt solutions with the aim of further enhancing and improving our system. The first stage of the policy review dealt with the priorities to be taken forward to help address the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The second stage of the review was undertaken by stakeholder-led working groups, which drew on a wide range of expertise and knowledge from representatives of all sectors include in the included in the debt landscape. And I welcome that those stakeholder groups, made up of people with lived experience, have informed the approach to this bill. 
Presiding officer, this bill contains powers which could which would allow Scottish ministers to create a, a mental health moratorium. Others have already described this as well this afternoon. Um, there are steps at charities like Change Mental Health and the Samaritans. They have welcomed these steps. This power, if used, will protect people with serious mental health issues from debt recovery action. And the idea of a moratorium providing special protection to those with serious mental health conditions achieved broad support in the bankruptcy and debt advice review consultation. Yes, I will give way. Stephen Kerr. Whatever Harper giving way. She mentioned change mental health, so maybe, and, and she cited them as being in support of the bill. And in principle, I'm sure they are. But she will have received a briefing, as I have where they outline specific areas of concern, at least four or five. One of them is the eligibility, one of them is the mental health moratorium register, the public register I've mentioned, and it goes on like this. Does she recognise that the lack of detail and substance in the bill is a stumbling block to those of us who want to see real progress, that want to see Scots treated on a fair basis and certainly no less fairly treated than people in England and Wales? Emma Harper, and I can give the time back. I thank Stephen Kerr for that intervention. I would, what I would um, uh, respond in that is that you know, Change Mental Health are really um, supportive of how we take things forward. What I would support is uh, Kevin Stewart's statements about lived experience being part of how we inform this as we take it forward at stage two. And I'm confident that the committee will know how to address this bill and issues that have been raised up in stage one and then as we move forward after the debate today. So, presiding officer, um, I would like to um, think about this uh, enabling power in the bill that establishes the moratorium that's included in the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill and responses to the Economy and Fair Work Committee show strong report for the principle of such protection, if understandably raising questions over the details. And I want to pick up on one other point which uh, some organisations have touched on regarding bankruptcy debt and employment. We are all too aware, particularly over COVID and in the current cost of living crisis, that many people have fallen into unsustainable debt, with around 700,000 people in Scotland reporting levels of unsustainable debt. However, due to this debt and even bankruptcy, people are being negatively impacted in terms of their ability to obtain certain types of employment. And this in turn creates a vicious cycle, as people can't get employment, then can't pay their debt, whereas if certain vetting and employment practices were changed, then people would be able to establish payment plans to manage their debt in a more sustainable way. So I would therefore ask the Minister whether he would consider entering some kind of dialogue with the UK Government to explore whether certain types of debt could be omitted from, for example, government and civil service vetting. Presiding officer, this bill is only one part of the programme of work to improve bankruptcy and diligence. The Scottish Government will introduce changes through secondary legislation, some of which is hoped will be laid before Parliament during the progress of the bill. And the Scottish Government has also commissioned a long-term review to assess how far, how far current statutory solutions meet the needs of a modern economy. Yvonne McDermott, OBE, accepted an appointment to lead stage three of that wider stakeholder review, and there will be some matters that merit further consideration as part of review, which is welcome. The bill is yet another example of how Scotland is making the pro process of bankruptcy and solvency fairer for those in that situation, and I welcome the bill and I will support it at stage one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Harper. I now call Pam Gosell to be followed by Ivan McKee around six minutes. Ms Gosell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to contribute to this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. The laws that deal with issues such as insolvency are both vast and complex, which is unsurprising for an area of law which can affect people's wellbeing so significantly. For people who are suffering with mental health issues, debt is something which will only make this worse. We know that one in two adults suffering with debt have mental health problems, and the COVID-19 pandemic still carries a legacy of financial challenges and increased debt for many individuals. Given this, the Law Society is right to highlight that changes to the law in this area are overdue. So this bill can be welcomed as part of the wider strategy to improve debt solutions and diligence. 
The Bill would introduce minor and technical changes to the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016, and these are to be welcomed. But much of the debate around the Bill focuses on proposed mental health moratorium, which would provide additional protection for specific groups of debtors. The, this moratorium would be similar to existing debt uh, respite scheme in England and Wales, which provides a breathing space for those receiving treatment for mental health crisis. While many stakeholders who provided views are highly supportive of this principle, it is disappointing that the Scottish Government did not set out any details of their proposed moratorium until the consultation was launched last November. And while we now, while, while we now have the rough sketch of how the moratorium might work, it remains the case that many important details will be decided through secondary legislation. It is, at le least welcome, sorry, it is at least welcome that the Government plans to reveal these draft regulations before Stage 3, but it would have allowed of better scrutiny if more details on these regulations had been revealed sooner. One key aspect still to be decided is who the eligibility for this moratorium with the current proposals restrict this to those who are currently subject to a compulsory treatment order. On this issue, the committee rightly recommends that the Scottish Government consider a wider approach. This would include mine, uh, mirroring the approach taken in England and Wales with the debt respite scheme. This option is also backed by groups including Change Mental Health, and it is something I hope Government considers. Other stakeholders, such as NatWest, have warned of potential side effects from extending the scope too far. Too far. And it is clear that there is a balance to be struck on this issue. An effective moratorium must also provide the right level of protection for those need that need it. For example, Poverty Alliance highlights the importance of stopping creditor contact. They point out that creditors sending regular text messages and letters reminding people that their debts are constantly increasing will only make their mental health issues even worse. For the moratorium being proposed by the Scottish Government would not stop contact, nor would it freeze interest charges or threats of eviction. If the moratorium is going to be effective, it cannot, pro it cannot provide a half-hearted level of protection. It should not be less ambitious than the existing debt respite scheme, which does offer additional protections, such as freezing contact from creditors. I therefore hope that the Government can listen to the advice of stakeholders and to the Committee's recommendations that the Government should reconsider what this moratorium would protect against. And as my colleague Murdo Fraser highlights, much of the debt and diligence proceedings is owed to public bodies such as local government. The ultimate recovery of this debt, where possible, is something that is often in the public interest. So it is clear that carefully drafted moratorium will be one which is able to strike the right balance between the rights of debtors or, uh, and rights of creditors. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill is an important piece of legislation, which one, one which makes small reforms with important consequences. Mental health issues and debt go together all too easily. Financial strain is a key driver of poor mental health, and anyone struggling to cover essential bills is at a higher risk of developing issues such as anxiety and depression. It is only right that these individuals are given the protection that an effective mental health moratorium could provide. But this Government still has work to do in order to ensure this moratorium is effective and the onus now lies with them to address the issues that Parliament has highlighted today. Going forward, I hope the Scottish Government will take a constructive approach and work with MSPs and other stakeholders to ensure this bill can live up to its full potential. The principles behind the bill are ones that all parties can get behind, and I hope all members can join the Scottish Conservatives in backing the Bankruptcy and Diligence Bill at Stage 1.
Thank you very much, Ms. Gothel. Uh, we now move to the final speaker in the open debate. Ivan McKee, around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, it is a pleasure to speak in this debate, and I, I thank the Minister and the Committee for the work that has been done on this um, technical but very important subject. Uh, and I just want to reflect back on um, Murdo Fraser's comments, which I found quite helpful in outlining the reasons why uh, we need bankruptcy legislation um, and highlighting the balance that is required uh, between protection. Uh, and allowing people to have that fresh start, but also recognising the, the, the issue of moral hazard. And particularly the points raised about the fact that, uh, that for many of the people that find themselves in a situation, much of that debt is uh, due to the public purse. Um, it is also important to recognise the uh, uh, impact uh, that uh, legislation in this area can have on the behaviour of financial institutions with regard to their willingness to lend. I think those points were well made. And also, while this uh, issue is, 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 of course, about um, bankruptcy measures relating to individuals and not businesses, I thought the contribution from Stephen Kerr um, around about the need to foster the entrepreneurial culture and spirit um, and the, the need to get that balance right in that regard uh, so that people feel able to uh, start businesses and then if they fail have the ability to move on and uh, apply their learnings to support the, the broader economy was, it was very well made. But turning to the specific measures in the, uh, the, the bill before us, um, I think it's true to say that households across Scotland are facing enormous pressures on their budgets and household financial resilience is already low before the pandemic with over 600,000 people indebted. Now, YouGov poll conducted for Citizens Advice Scotland suggests over 60,000 people in Scotland have either got into debt for the first time or seen existing debts get worse over the course of the pandemic. So while the cost of living crisis has increased these pressures for everyone, inflation has been felt most acutely, of course, by low-income households who have little or no disposable income to absorb these increases. Poverty and poor mental health are interlinked and mutually reinforcing, and poverty is the single biggest driver of poor mental health, and living with mental health needs can increase the risk of poverty. 50 per cent of adults struggling with debt um, also have a mental health issue. And many of the income shocks that can lead to problem debt can also have a huge impact on mental wellbeing, from loss of employment to bereavement, termination of welfare payments and relationship breakdowns. So I'm pleased that the legislation is recognising this link. And I'm also pleased that the Scottish Government will be holding a lived experience session at the end of February to hear firsthand from those who have experienced severe mental health issues and debt challenges. Look forward to hearing the feedback from this event and understand this is something that was recommended by the committee. A moratorium on debt repayment can provide the space required for recovery and halt the vicious cycle of increasing debt and worsening mental health. And the government has said that the aim of these legislative changes is to help to improve the lives of people who are struggling with problem debt and serious mental health issues. There have been calls and evidence uh, taken during stage one that there are some changes that, uh, that must be made to ensure this legislation achieves its aims. As it stands, uh, the moratorium will only apply to those in compulsory treatment. Um, comments have been made about the, the breathing space um, project in uh, England and Wales. Uh, and while this Parliament, of course, um, should uh, make its own decisions, it is always instructive to learn from what others are doing. That uh, process is, of course, open to anyone who is receiving mental health crisis treatment. Um, and the committee heard the evidence uh, from uh, those who were in favour of widening eligibility in that regard. I would be interested to hear the government's response to the recommendations in this area, because, of course, those who are in crisis uh, need this support and it should be given at the earliest uh, opportunity. The government's commitment to providing advice to individuals via the channel of their choice is welcome, um, but evidence suggests that there are concerns around the capacity of money advice services. Uh, Organisations such as the Greater Easter House Money Advice Project, GMAP, and Financial Included, um, amongst others in my own Glasgow province constituency, included. It was reassuring to hear the Minister mention this in his opening remarks, and I look forward to hearing how the government will ensure that the sector is supported to deliver the required services uh, going forward. The needs of those with mental health issues are often complex, and engagement can be difficult as a consequence. As well as capacity, there is a need for us to support the sector to develop and test ways of working better with those facing difficulties with their mental health 
Citizens Advice Scotland has indicated that there should be more partnership working between money advice and mental health services, and I am keen to hear how the government can support collaborative working in this area. There is also scope for clearer guidance and training for mental health professionals and money advisors to allow them to effectively support people to enable those in need to access the mental health moratorium. Guidance should also be available to creditors to make their role and responsibilities clear. And it is good to see that the Scottish Government is listening and agrees that clear guidance and training should be provided. And it will be good to see what this guidance looks like in practice. President officer, I welcome this legislation and look forward to seeing how these recommendations um, uh, look going forward uh, and seeing how they, they will be incorporated into the bill. Um, and if the concerns identified across the chamber are taken into account, this could be a productive step in addressing the mutually reinforcing relationship between poor mental health and poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr McKee. We now move to the closing speeches. I am disappointed to note that one member who was participating in the debate is not in the chamber for the closing speeches. I will expect an explanation and an apology for that. I now call Katie Clark. Uh, around seven minutes, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it is a pleasure to wind up this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour and indeed to follow Ivan McKee, who was correct to talk about the financial struggles that many people in Scotland are currently facing. In the last Parliament, the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee recommended that the Scottish Government review the debt solutions available to people with problem debt. We supported this recommendation and whilst we broadly support the provisions in this bill today, we believe that far more needs to be done to address how we deal with those who find themselves in debt, particularly in a cost of living crisis. We believe that there are many other areas of bankruptcy law which need updated. There has been discussion about some of that today, in particular some of the thresholds, for example, in relation to wage arrestments. And as somebody who has not been sitting on the committee, I would be interested to hear from the Minister um, whether there are further proposals coming forward um, following on the recommendation um, in 2019. We do have some issues with some of the drafting of this bill and believe that many of the clauses are too widely defined, which we hoped will be an issue which will be addressed um, in amendments. We agree that the Parliament needs to see the detail before stage three. As Daniel Johnson says, we support the general principles of this bill. But like many others in this chamber, we hope it will be strengthened as it goes forward. I was not involved in the scrutiny process of the bill, but many of the criticisms that I've heard today, and indeed which occurred to me when I looked at the black letter of the bill before us are criticisms that I've heard many times in relation to bills that come before this Parliament. A lack of detail provided on the face of the bill and a lack of detail provided to the committee that is charged with scrutinising the proposals. I don't think it's acceptable that the Scottish Parliament is continuously put in this position, but I hope in relation to this bill that some of these criticisms are addressed as this particular bill goes through this Parliament. As Colin Beattie said, much of the focus of this debate has been on the proposals relating to the mental health moratorium. Labour supports the principle of establishing a mental health moratorium on debt recovery action. Much of the detail, however, around how this proposed mental health moratorium will operate in practice is being left to secondary legislation. And indeed, the Minister made very clear that this is enabling legislation. We believe that this detail should have been provided on the face of this bill today. And as we say, we hope that there will be amendments to give clarity going forward. However, if it remains the case that the bill is much as currently drafted, we hope um, that given the level of detail that is going to have to be incorporated in regulations, that the affirmative procedure is used um, in considering any secondary legislation. 
As Stephen Carr and indeed a number of Conservative members pointed out, the proposals as presented to this Parliament give those with mental health problems potentially less protections than south of the border. Keith Brown suggested um, that it would not be acceptable simply to mirror legislation from south of the border, and I agree with him on that point. Um, the, the law of bankruptcy is very different um, in Scotland and always has been um, from south of the border. I think it is completely legitimate to say that it is actually quite shocking if we end up with poorer protections than south of the border. I did agree, however, um, with what Keith Brown was saying relating to the public register. I think those were important points to be put on the record. Um, and I believe that the provisions in relation to this need very careful consideration, given the human rights implications um, for those impacted, who often will be some of the most vulnerable in our society. The convener of the committee outlined the range of evidence the committee took to engage with those who work in the DEC sector and again made clear the disappointment of the committee at the lack of detail provided to enable the committee to carry out their role to scrutinise the proposals. She spoke about the small number of people who may benefit from the proposals, in particular in relation to the monitorium, and highlighted the high numbers of people who are in debt and who have mental health problems, and indeed the high percentage of those who have mental health problems who are in debt a point that was very well reinforced by Kevin Stewart. We note the representations made by Change Mental Health, that the eligibility for entering a mental health monitorium is too narrow, a point also reinforced by the convener of the committee. As I say, we support in broad terms the proposals in this bill. In particular, we support the proposal to allow the minimum asset bankruptcy um, to take place every five years. We think this is consistent with the approach which has been discussed today to enable the possibility of people who get into difficulty a fresh start. Murder Fraser highlighted the lack of capacity in the debt sector. This is a very important point which has been made by a number of members. Um, and indeed, in the past, there have been very strong representations in this Parliament, for example, for a debt amnesty for low income families and those in receipt of benefits. Um, there's been calls for debt advice levies on financial um, uh, benefits and a range of extra resources to frontline advisers. Um, I believe that that issue is central to this debate because whatever legislation we have in place, we have to recognise that those who are seeking to rely on the legislation are at a particularly vulnerable point in their lives. They're often very vulnerable people. Um, and it is essential that there is a framework around about the legislation so that it is enabled to be used appropriately. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Clark. I now call uh, Brian Whittle for around eight minutes. Uh, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, first start by apologising to the Chamber and especially to the Minister for my late arrival uh, in the Chamber? Uh, I wish I could come up with some wonderful reason for that. Uh, unfortunately, I was simply misreading the, the, the start time of this particular debate. But in, uh, to be fair, as it been pointed out to me, I was earlier than I'm usually late. So, um, <laughs> Presiding Officer, may I start by equity, uh, echoing the thanks of the, uh, the uh, committee convener to all those who gave evidence to us about the bill, uh, to SPICE for the very helpful background briefings, and to the committee clerks for their assistance in preparation of this report. As has been demonstrated in this debate, the committee agreed the report unanimously, with very little discourse through uh, the evidence gathering process. And there have been some very, very interesting uh, speeches today, and, and for a technical bill, perhaps that was rather unexpected. I would highlight you know, the experience of Fergus Shewing and, 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 uh, and Daniel Johnson's intervention. And to my colleague Murder Fraser, with his usual attention to detail, helpfully framed the implications of the bankruptcy law and the negative connotations of the term bankruptcy. In doing so, he highlighted that bankruptcy provides a solution for those who find themselves in a situation of not being able to meet their financial obligations. 
avoiding that need uh, of, for debtors to be pursued by creditors indefinitely. In effect, it is offering a way to clear the decks, so to speak. But all the while, we need to understand that there is a balance to be sought between creditors and debtors. In evidence, we heard that in cases we are considering it is predominantly public bodies, such as HMRC, local councils, and especially council tax arrears that are often the main creditors. This throws up that need uh, to balance the needs of debtors against the collection of funds which, of course, support public services. So to the bill itself, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, as has been mentioned by committee members, it is mostly a minor and technical changes to existing bankruptcy legislation. Much of the evidence taken and discussed in committee centred around the debtors with significant mental illness and therefore their capacity to adequately attend to the debt recovery processes against them, which we all agree is, is a very legitimate reason to support a moratorium on the recovery of said debt. Others in the debate have cited a similar scheme in England and Wales, uh, breathing space, where individuals receiving uh, what is termed crisis treatment are afforded such protections. These include those subject to compulsory orders, but crucially, crucially includes those suffering from conditions of comparable severity receiving crisis, emergency or acute treatment without compulsion. However, again during our evidence session, the committee heard that the proposed entry criteria should not only apply to those subject to compulsory orders, excluding those with severe and significant mental health conditions that are voluntary. The narrow narrowness of this criteria was criticised by several agencies who gave evidence such as One Parent Family Scotland and the Poverty Alliance. The concern was that this approach would only help a very small number of patients, include many who would also need this particular service. Furthermore, there was concern as to the resource required to make such a mental health monitoring work in practice. And I think my interaction with, with Daniel Johnson highlighted uh, uh, the need for the Scottish Government to furnish us with more information and that they are allowed, uh, allowed sufficient time for detailed parliamentary scrutiny prior to the commencement of the Stage 3 Bill. And I think uh, my colleague Stephen Kerr will be highlighting uh, the, the need to, to not create law in this kind of vacuum and, and, and the limitations of secondary legislation. And there's no point delivering a bill that cannot be practically delivered, no matter the intention or the good intention of the Scottish Government. The suggestion is that mental health experts be allowed to certify a required level of impact from mental health problems using a similar form to the debt and mental health evidence form currently used in the monetary advice sector, and they consider using entry-level criteria similar to those used by the, what I mentioned, uh, breathing space in England and Wales. In doing so, it is important that the resource issue is addressed both in terms of mental health support and ensuring that the money advice sector is adequately resourced to attend to the potentially expanding workload. It was noted that the proposed moratorium may put additional pressures on the money advice sector and that this sector was already operating under significant restraints. So, once again, raising the issue of the need for the Scottish Government to address the resource requirement to make the implementation of the Bill practical. Training and guidance to the sector must form a big part of the Bill's implementation. It was also noted from the uh, Delegate Powers and Reform Law Reform Committee that moratoria are meant to be temporary <coughs> and that the Bill fails to specify a maximum duration. However, we do support a two-stage approach with an open-ended first phase to allow the individual to focus on recovery without the, uh, having to contend with the serious worries of debt. We welcome assurances from the Minister that there will be no plans to reduce the standing moratorium for its current uh, six months. An issue that the committee discussed was that the compulsory treatment, um, who, uh, those in compulsory treatment who do not have the capacity to consent to a mental health moratorium or have a legally uh, recognised representation to do so for them will not be able to access the scheme. So we do ask the Scottish Government to ensure that this process allows for access to all those who are eligible. I would also like to note that on the other side of this issue, there are creditors uh, and any delay in payment of these debts could jeopardise some businesses. So just a note, presenting office, that in, in delivering a bill that creditors' needs are also not overlooked. Presenting officer, this bill may not have uh, impact many individuals. However, the, prote uh, the, the protection that it will afford uh, to, those, uh, in, uh, uh, to those who need is significant to them. 
Um, and the committee, as have other members, have raised concerns over the lack of detail from the Scottish Government on how the bill will be implemented. It is therefore welcome that the Minister has committed to delivering these details prior to Stage 3. And once again, uh, Presiding Officer, I would like to thank uh, all those who gave evidence to the committee clerks and to my fellow committee uh, members for the work done in bringing this report to Parliament. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. And I now call on Tom Arthur to uh, wind up the debate, Minister, around about 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking all members across the Chamber for their contributions in what I thought was a very thoughtful and considered debate, and also reiterate my thanks to uh, commit the committee, the committee members, clerks and all who have given evidence and indeed who have all who have engaged with the Scottish Government through the stakeholder working groups and the recent consultation. Um, this is one of those particular areas which um, I think naturally uh, creates a great deal of consensus and tone because it deals with one of the uh, part of the sort of fundamental architecture of what underpins a, a functioning state, the ability to enforce contracts and there is within that um, an important balance to be struck, as has been reflected in this debate, between the interests of debtors who we want to ensure have maximum protection, but also the interest of creditors. And that word credit, with its origins and trust and the confidence that is needed for creditors in a functioning system of insolvency, is absolutely vital. Because without that, without that trust, without that confidence, we could unintentionally harm the very people we want to protect and deny access to credit to those um, who we want to ensure can have access to credit. So this is a, a debate that, um, and a, a bill that cuts to some very fundamental issues, despite the short and indeed technical nature of it. I would also want to just reflect there's a number of I think, outstanding contributions right across um, this debate, and in particular com com comments of my colleague Kevin Stewart. I think my Fergus Ewan made a very powerful speech, and indeed Murdo Fraser as well. And I'm very grateful to these members who have extensive experience for bringing that to bear in this debate. And I would want to say to them personally, and indeed to all members across the chamber, that I'd be very keen in picking up on a point that Pam Gosso raised to have direct engagement with MSPs, opposition spokespersons, committee members ahead of stage two and indeed stage three of this bill um, and to be able to share more of the work that the government is undertaking to ensure we can build maximum consensus. Now I think there's, there's a number of themes that we could touch on. I suppose if I maybe distilled them down into a handful it would be the balance between what should be in primary and secondary legislation. Within that the entry criteria, the question of a public register and then that broader point of the balance of interest which will inform much of what we do. Turning to the, the issue of primary and, and secondary legislation, I may stand here in my capacity as a government minister, but I never forget that I stand here first and foremost as a, an elected member of this parliament, and we all have a duty to defend the interests of this parliament. So I completely understand and appreciate the interest that members have in ensuring that parliament can play its full role and that as much information is provided on the face of a bill as possible. So decisions around what should be in the face of a bill and what should be in secondary legislation are not decisions that are taken lightly. The position that we have adopted here is one not entirely dissimilar to the arrangements in England and Wales which have been referred to, i.e. with a parent act and the substantive aspects of the scheme set out in regulations. What we have sought to do in achieving that is to allow us flexibility, indeed to recognise that this can be a, a dynamic area of law, it would allow us to respond through secondary legislation, and we think that is a proportionate use of Parliament's time. But I do recognise the concern for detail, which is why we have made the commitment to provide draft regulations to the committee ahead of stage three, and indeed to hold a full public consultation on the regulations, which will afford a substantial period of time for the committee to consider. I would want to provide reassurance to members who express concerns as to whether there might be an element of um, overreach within these regulation-making powers. It's at section 1, um, subparagraph 1. It's defined as Scottish ministers may, make regula may by regulations make provisions establishing a moratorium on debt recovery action by creditors against individuals who have a mental illness. So the purpose of the regulations, the purpose of the moratorium is clearly set in, and that creates the context in which these further powers um, would be utilised. And indeed, at subparagraph 4, regulations under this section are subject to the affirmative procedure to give reassurance. Katie Clark on that particular point. Happy to give way. Daniel Johnson. <laughs> so, so, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving point. There's both a specific point and a general point I'd like to make. 
the specific point is that's all true, but subsection 3 also en enables uh, ministers to make uh, provision for different purposes and in, indeed on any enactment. That, that is quite broad. Uh, the, the, the more general point is, would he reflect upon the point that a framework bill is all well and good, but it actually does have to set a frame, some principles, some points, albeit to be further elucidated. But as it stands, the government could choose to actually bring forward none of the features set out in subsection 2 of section 1. Uh, you know, in, in, in essence, we don't know what kind of a, uh, a proposal will be brought forward at all. It's completely open. Would the, would the Minister acknowledge that point? Minister. Well, obviously, that is why we have made that commitment to bring forward draft regulations to the committee and indeed why we have consulted and indeed um, there's been an opportunity for members for the committee and indeed for stakeholders to participate in that consultation. We'll reflect very carefully on what emerges from that consultation. I, I do recognise the points that have been raised, but I would also recognise an evidence that the committee received that Citizens Advice Scotland spoke favourably of um, creating this scheme through regulations, because it does give us the flexibility required. And indeed, I appreciate there are perhaps conflicting views in terms of whether we should start small or be more um, expansive in the introduction of a scheme. But what regulations would allow us to do is to start small, recognising the importance of getting that balance of interest correct, and then through regulations based upon evidence and learning to expand the scheme. But I'm happy to give further reflection to the points that have been raised within the debate. T turning to what would be in the scheme itself, this question of criteria has received a considerable amount of attention. It is one I want to give, as you would imagine, further careful and detailed consideration to, both to reflect on the uh, further reflect on the views of the committee and evidence that the committee received, but also what we have received via our consultation, and to have further engagement with um, uh, members of this parliament. Because I, I do recognise the issue of criteria does get to the, to the heart of that point around balance and balancing interests. We, of course, want this to be a um, scheme that adds value, that provides something that is of use, and even if it is a small number of people, can make a material and positive impact on them. But we. Do recognise that point around balance of the interest of debtors and creditors. Yes, I'll give way. Brian Whittle. Very grateful for the minister to give way. Would he, would he uh, accept that the, this bill, the, the importance of this bill, is how we recognise serious mental illness pertaining to people's ability to, to deal with debt, and in doing so, ensuring that the resources are available to make sure that this bill is practically implemented. Minister. Yes, and we absolutely recognise the, the importance of close engagement with both the um, debt and money advice sector and mental health professionals to ensure that this scheme is properly resourced so it can be effective. I would recognise that one of the consequences of having a more um, expansive uh, criteria would perhaps mean more people using the scheme. So again, that is something we would have to take into consideration. Another point I wanted to touch to... Yes, very briefly. Stephen Kerr. It is a very brief intervention and grateful to the Minister for giving way. But can he undertake now before Parliament that the protections that will be offered to people in these distressing circumstances in Scotland will be no less than those available to people in similar situations in England and Wales? Can he give that very firm assurance that we will not have less protection available to these people, vulnerable people than is available in England and Wales? Minister. I appreciate the member's point, so let me, let me answer it sincerely. We do have a, a different suite of law regarding mental health in Scotland to England. There's a different framework within which we operate. But I recognise the intent and want to ensure maximum protection. These recommendations are stakeholder-led, and I want to work with stakeholders and with colleagues in Parliament to sure, ensure we can offer the best protection that we possibly can. So I'm committed to working constructively in that spirit, and that's why I've been committed to writing to the UK government, for example, on the matters around prepayment metres. So I'm very happy to engage in that and to explore if we can not only achieve parity, but surpass the protections that are available in England and Wales. But that will ultimately be a process of collaboration and engagement with stakeholders and in making sure we land a scheme that works effectively in Scotland and has no unintended consequences. But so I hope the member can accept that response in the spirit in which it's intended in terms of how we want to take things forward. I do want to turn to just two other uh, 
one other point primarily before concluding, presiding officer. That is the issue of public, uh, public register, which I can appreciate has caused understandable concern. Clearly, we want to be able to ensure that we again can balance the interests of debtors and creditors, but we would not want to do anything that had the consequence of um, stigmatising the scheme and, and in doing so impact uptake, of the, uh, impact uptake of the scheme because that would be self-defeating. So again, that is a matter we're going to give further very detailed consideration to and have further engagement. I think there's a recognition of the need of creditor interest to be protected within this, legitimate creditor interest, but we cannot do that in such a way that risks stigma and undermining the scheme from the outset. There are a number of other points that have been raised um, that can be considered through secondary legislation, both on the uh, minimum assets process and on earnings harassment. I have committed to having further engagement and discussion in that space with stakeholders. My door is open to members as well in that place. Um, Murdo Fraser um, raised a number of areas, including discharge of trustees, petition for serving bankruptcy, um, and the restees' duty of disclosure compliance. On all of these areas, we are having further engagement with stakeholders. Officials are having meetings, and again, happy to have further discussion with members who have an interest in this area. Can I again just um, thank members, presiding officer, for their, um, I think, very thoughtful and considered contributions throughout this debate. And again, reiterate my thanks to the committee and all who have contributed to this process. Um, I'm very much looking forward to further engagement with stakeholders ahead of stage two. I would reiterate the point that my door is open to any member who wants to engage further on these issues, and I would um, ask members to back the general principles of this bill at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. That concludes the debate on bankruptcy and diligence Scotland Bill at stage one. Um, it is time to move on to the next item of business, and at this point I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of standing orders that decision time be brought forward to now, and I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move such a motion. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm gladly happy to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. The question is that decision time uh, be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, thank you. Um, and there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. Uh, the question is that motion 12070 in the name of Tom Arthur on bankruptcy and diligence Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed and that concludes decision time. There will be a brief pause before we move on to members' business.